So, Torin Blankensmith. <laughs> <laughs> Um, he's a creative technologist, graphic artist, and educator teaching intro and advanced interactive and immersive environment, advanced creative coding, as well as adaptive assistive technology at Parsons, the new school in New York. Really happy that that actually worked out, that you uh, came here in person. Um, he's also working at Studio Elsewhere, creating restorative immersive environments in collaboration with neuroscientists focused on patient and medical workers' well-being. Um, Torin is also well known in the community for co-creating Shader Park in collaboration with Peter Widden, an open source online tool for generating real-time graphics using tools, uh, using code. And in our opening talk, uh, Torin will cover a wide variety of projects from an array of disciplines um, like the Liquid Archive and Evolving Journey through MIT's history, which he has been developing, and we look forward <clears throat> to learning more about a new component that's being revealed today. Thank you. All right. Hey, hey. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm like so, so excited that I got to actually be here in person. I was a little worried with the, the strike that things weren't going to line up, but uh, we made it. <laughs> um, I feel like in a, a talk setting, I feel like it's a little like nerve wracking with an audience. So I feel like my uh, intent here was to uh, kick things off by sharing a somewhat embarrassing video of myself in high school. <laughs> so um, you might be wondering, like, what's what's in this box? And um, it's not it's not just any box. It's actually a very special box to me. I, I think that this project I can kind of pinpoint as my entry into creative technology, and uh, it was actually started. Uh, I, did, I didn't really have any like. Uh, coding background. I knew I was interested in technology, and uh, at my high school, there was really nothing there. And so my mom was actually an art teacher at my high school, and she reached out to a local robotics company to bring in uh, Makerspace. And basically, from that Makerspace, we started learning some like Arduino and processing and things like that. And this project, my friend Jordan and I, Basically, just started making this from scratch. Uh, we wanted to make a, like audio reactive drum kit project, and so we started cutting a bunch of extension cables and soldering them to little like refrigerator relays. And uh, I'll, I'll play it for you. I'm amazed that this didn't catch on fire, and I think there should be there should be audio. I don't know if there's a yeah. Is it going? <clears throat> Sensors. Woo! Cool. Thank you. I never thought I'd get a chance to uh, force an entire audience to listen to me drum in high school, so thank you for that. Um, so, oh, don't, don't play it again. Um, so, OK, I actually had an opportunity to go back to the same high school and then teach a class on Touch Designer. Uh, for me, it was like such a, such a core uh, part of like, my introduction to working with art and code. And so I wanted to show you all some of the projects that this group of high schoolers worked on. We basically had three weeks where students got an opportunity to um, learn touch designer. They basically like formed bands and they were like, you're going to do a performance in front of the entire school at the end of the three weeks. So they, they formed bands, learned a bunch of songs, and then I taught them touch designer for the first half and then they played music for the second half. And uh, they, they presented in front of the whole school and I remember they turned all the lights off and the, in the auditorium it's like dead quiet. And I remember hearing uh, from the back, they were like, are they just going to play with the lights off? And they had no idea what was going to happen. So I ended up catching uh, some videos of like the, the kind of like pre-show, but uh, strobe warning is a couple pieces. Submarine. 
I was completely blown away by the work that they put together. So I was taking the same content that I was teaching to groups of like masters and undergrad students, and the high schoolers were amazing. They like all of that was from scratch, and uh, they also had like each member of the band would go up and live perform the visuals as well. And it was it was so fun to just see see that kind of come full circle. Um, it was uh, we'll call it a success. <laughs> That's my mom in the center. <laughs> yeah. um, post post uh, high school era into into uni uh, or university, depending on where you're from. Um, I I was really interested in art and code, but didn't really feel like there was kind of a combo of those two. And so my friend Peter Whitten and I started doing these weekly meetups where we would teach uh, art and code to like anyone who wanted to come and join. And so we, we were teaching things like processing and P5 shaders, uh, Vue.js, and um, we actually, from that group, the initial prototype for Shader Park was born. And so the whole goal was to take shader programming and make it more accessible. And we, we got to do a little demo recently. <laughs> um, but we've actually collaborated on a number of projects. So any of the like AI like related tools, Peter and I have like collaborated on. He's been working on a lot of the, the research to try and make that more accessible as well. Um, I kind of wanted to dip into some of my work at Studio Elsewhere. So this, this, isn't, this project isn't using TD specifically, but I think that the research behind it, I think, is really, really interesting, specifically for immersive environments and kind of the implications around that. So uh, I joined this studio. It's a really small group based out of New York. It's around like 10 people, and the dev team is like me. Uh, it's four people and uh, two other developers, including me, or two other developers. Um, so yeah, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when I joined this group, we it basically was like a meal program. We were trying to find like any way to bring some type of change to the, uh, the frontline staff. And we built out these immersive recharge rooms that were basically taking projected content and custom lighting and scent. And one thing that we found from this, uh, a lot of this was based off of biophilic design and biophilic principles, which is kind of comes from architecture. And so the whole thought process there is to take elements of nature and bring it into the uh, you know, the actual environment that you're, you're living in. And uh, one thing that we found, we were like, can you, can you kind of like bridge that with technology? Can you kind of like trick the senses and give a similar effect? And we were really, really amazed. So these were some of the rooms, we filmed all of our own content. And um, there, from like self-reporting, there was around like a 59% drop in stress, just from having these types of immersive environments, uh, which was, Really, really interesting. I feel like the fact that you can have a digital space like this that can have a, a positive impact in that way is, is really interesting. So you can have an intervention in a space like that. Um, we, we did uh, a, like all of our own custom capture for it. So we went in and uh, filmed a lot of the different locations. But the reality is behind the scenes, a lot of times it looked like this, <laughs> trying, to, trying to get a good shot. Uh, and this, this led into a, a really, really fun project. It was a collaboration with uh, Mount Sinai. And we actually used Touch Designer to build out a capture system for a neuroscience lab. So we were working with uh, Helen Mayberg, who pioneered a lot of research in deep brain stimulation for treatment-resistant depression. And so the goal was to basically work with the scientists to build out a capture system that would allow them to monitor kind of like uh, motion in general and then facial expression and audio. And the goal was to be able to like track the progress of the patient to make sure that a surgery would, uh, to predict whether or not the surgery worked uh, and it was successful before any type of self-reporting. Um, so I can't speak too much about the project, um, but no, behind the scenes, uh, TD is, is running all of that. And then we had a, a Unreal powering some of the game environment. And later on, we actually switched to use Touch Designer for a lot of the uh, interactive uh, elements of it. And so similarly, we it kind of like built off of some of the immersive uh, environments as well, kind of looking at different breathing exercises um, and having kind of this recording station set up. And uh, this is some little behind the scenes as well of like, the install process. And I feel like it's not a real install unless I'm in a garbage bag and potentially in the ceiling of one of the hospitals. Um, this is Isaac Sante and Misha Kuma. 
uh, and June Moon, who's not showcased in this, is also part of the core, the core tech team. Um, this is a project that we got to work on with the Abilities Research Center. So similarly, like building out a environment in a children's center. Um, we basically worked on a face tracking setup to be able to um, allow allow the, the kids in the space to be able to paint a, a butterfly with their nose and have it projected into the game environment. And um, I wanted to get to this project. So this is actually launching today uh, in a couple hours. So fingers crossed my phone doesn't go off. Um, but this was a, a permanent installation that's going into a hospital in Michigan Medicine. And we uh, took a lot of the principles from the neuroscience lab and the research there and kind of set them up with some general hypotheses around how we could um, have different types of interventions for the frontline staff. So this is directly in their, um, yeah, uh, connected, like literally right next to their break room for a lot of the frontline workers uh, and medical workers. And yeah, I'll, I'll show you a little, little demo of it. So everything except for the last one was all, all TD. Um, but basically, we uh, for this project, one of the main areas that I focused on was uh, figuring out how to collaborate with, how to, how to set up the Touch Designer project to work in a permanent installation. There's really no one who's going to be on staff there to kind of like unplug or plug in the connect or reboot the computer. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of the little pieces behind the scenes to make sure that the setup is going to work remotely and that we can monitor everything. Um, but also, I feel like one, one huge part of that process as well was setting it up to be able to collaborate with uh, our composer. So we worked with uh, Tim Fain, who's a, he does a lot of uh, film scores and does uh, violin. And uh, he basically, uh, what I was trying to do was uh, work with him in software that he was familiar with. So we set up the project to run in Ableton. So it's, a, it's all TD Ableton. Uh, and we basically uh, built out like a, a whole setup so that we could have live motion tracking from the Kinect and then be able to control all the audio uh, in, in real time. So your motion will control the audio and visuals. Um, and then also just to be able to collaborate on the different visual pieces that we've set up so that we can like remotely deploy new, new pieces of uh, the installation. Yeah. 
And um, but the other part was super, super fun, was just setting it up as well, so that uh, I, I ended up getting to bring uh, two of my students from Parsons into the studio. And um, so for this collaboration, we, we worked together to uh, build out a bunch of the different visuals as well. Um, so another thing that I wanted to share with you all is this project that I got to work on with um, the yeah with uh, Richard Tay from uh, Take Me Nile, and this was a really really fun project. I actually kind of got brought in towards the later stages of the project. Um, Brian Ma worked on like a lot of the core development of the project. Uh, and so this is all actually running in Touch Designer, and there's basically a machine learning model that's running behind the scenes. And um, what they've done is they've, it's been trained on a whole collection from the MIT Museum. And over time, uh, these pieces will basically navigate through different uh, elements of the collection and then display it over time. So this is up and like on site at the MIT Museum. And I'll give you a little, a little background for it. For this project, I actually get to collaborate with uh, uh, the main. The main area that I focused on was the uh, the blobs. <laughs> um, so it was really fun. I got brought in to uh, do some some shader work on this and uh, to basically put some visual polish and and like kind of look at a number of different interactions for the visuals so they can kind of progress over time. So I experimented with a bunch of different like spring animations and things like that in Touch Designer, um, but also. Um, kind of building it as a toolkit. Like one thing that I really try to bring into a lot of these projects is kind of like for whatever I'm making, I'll try to like either build a toolkit for myself or for someone else. And I feel like just kind of like setting up a component like that to allow someone to have simple visual control over something like that just was so, so helpful. Um, another piece that I explored as well was setting up kind of a, a generative audio component to this. So that way, uh, the composer that had set up the audio for this project, um, we could have all of the audio like loop through in a generative way so that we could kind of have a number of different pairings for it um, and just progress over time. And um, yeah, should tonight Brian to also also talk through the, the, the core, core mechanics um, for the, the rest of this project. But yeah, this was super, super fun to work on. Um, another piece that I wanted to showcase was uh, a collaboration that I got to do with Yo-Yo Lin. And um, so this was a performance that we put on at The Shed in New York. And um, I wish, I, I only have like a one hour video clip, so <laughs> I, could, I could kind of like cut through a couple pieces of it, but I'll, I'll just share some images in general. Um, this, this performance was um, really, really, amazing to see Yo-Yo's journey with this. So this project really focused on Yo-Yo's uh, experience with chronic pain. And the goal, um, it, she basically had 
like laid out the narrative and my goal was to basically collaborate with Yo-Yo to capture her visual style and then to try and help bring it into this live performance setting. So she actually also collaborated with the remote performer, uh, Palena KK. And so I worked with the two of them to basically like try to figure out their, their general like aesthetic and style and then build a whole show rig that we could use uh, to projection map onto the, there's like a scrim cube. So it's a, yeah, that's on, on either side um, for the performance. And um, the, the part that was really fun as well is kind of like, similarly, some of the fun technical difficulties of this one was trying to do motion capturing in pretty low light. So we ended up using a, a Kinect. I think ideally, I definitely want to kind of move towards using the webcam things uh, just because of the, the responsiveness of it. But given, given the constraint of like low light and also the, the fact that it was being projected right behind it, it made kind of this infinite feedback loop set up. So we were, uh, the Kinect was, <laughs> was the way to go. And um, it was really fun as well. So she had worked earlier with uh, my friend Avnish to basically do more like WebGL uh, based shaders uh, for some of the, the performances. So I, I ended up uh, porting some of those different uh, graphics into Touch Designer. And then for like later parts of the performance was figuring out how to bring in the remote performer who was actually based out of New Zealand at the time. So we were like just like praying that everything was gonna go well, that we could get all of the like live audio and video from the um, from Palena KK in uh, based out of that area. And um, yeah, so I'll, I'll, uh, I can share maybe a link to the video later, and, and definitely, definitely, if you can uh, check out check out Yo-Yo's performance. Hey, there we go. Um, so one thing I wanted to do was kind of just show a new project that I've been working on. Uh, so I'm gonna do a quick little live demo, and uh, fingers crossed this will work correctly. Um, some of you may have seen a project I have been working on recently, which was basically trying to get rid of the Connect. <laughs> so uh, I feel like it's it's like expensive. It only runs on Windows, and so one thing I've been really interested in is um, using kind of like. Uh, another machine learning model in order to be able to do this type of body tracking in real time. And um, I, my, I went through like a number of different approaches at first. I actually first started with just trying to like use the uh, script top or the script chop uh, in order to just like use an existing ML model. So uh, Google released this model called MoveNet and I pour, like went through the process of actually porting it directly into Touch Designer only to find out that uh, it's only trained and optimized either for uh, WebGL or for mobile. And I was like, great. <laughs> so that doesn't leave us with many options. Um, so I feel like one one theme that has been like kind of surprising. I, I initially like my entry point into a lot of the like TD things was working in uh, as web in web development beforehand. So it's been kind of funny to kind of come full circle. And I feel like a lot of the the pieces that I've been integrating into Touch Designer have been like taking some web technology and then finding ways of like bringing that type of content into TD. Uh, so this is my, my new updated component for it. Um, so yeah, but behind the scenes, this is basically, uh, yeah, this is using MoveNet from Google and this is running uh, TensorFlow.js. So the model will just like run the post tracking in the browser. And the thing that's great about it is that it's gonna run at 60 frames a second versus like the Kinect's max, like 20 something frames per second. I feel like when you're getting the actual raw data in Touch Designer, it can be quite, uh, quite, quite slow. And um, if you, anyone had seen kind of my previous demo on this, this Kinect setup, um, what, was, what I had previously was that you could just load this website and then um, what would happen is, I'll try this again. <laughs> okay. Um, you could have it running separately um, and basically using uh, the technology of WebSockets, to, which is just a protocol to quickly send information really quickly over the internet. Uh, I was piping that information through, but one of the things is that I didn't, it didn't feel like a good installation setup. 
um, I kind of wanted to have a component that I would feel comfortable running in some type of installation. And so my main requirements for that were like, okay, it's got to run offline. I can't, I can't have like anything, anything downloaded on the fly. Um, and then also I needed to be able to have control over, um, some of the like core elements of it as well. Like I needed to be able to switch the webcam uh, and bring in some of the multi-post detection. And uh, this is new. Well, <laughs> but I guess one thing uh, yeah, I wanted to share real quick is uh, this is interesting. I wonder if this is the lines material. Maybe. Yeah. Well, this is just the default. Uh, this is the point render component. Huh. Are there too many lines? I don't think so. It's just a couple points, but uh, I bet I bet if I just put down the uh, let's look at point clouds, point render. Give it to you. Oh, <laughs> so apparently that fixed it. Cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. So the thing that I th is really exciting about this. Um, one thing that I had found previously is uh, you'd have to like open up the website. And actually, this is running in. Uh, it was very very sweet. I, I reached out on the forum and I got a brand new build of TD. So this is a little. A little pre-release of the the next version of uh, of TD, and uh, there. So this is working with the web, web render component. One thing that I had found in the past, so you could just load up the website, and um, what I was doing is like piping over the body tracking data from uh, MoveNet into Touch Designer in real time. The main problem is that if you put Touch Designer into a perform mode, it's not gonna like either the website will take priority or Touch Designer will take priority. And so uh, by embedding it into the web render component, it'll actually work at a full frame rate in the browser. So we've got, we've got real time body tracking. Uh, and then I also brought in like the, um, the joint score. So you can, it'll basically determine like the, how accurate it thinks those points are. And the, the one thing though is like, I found in a lot of the projects that I was working on, I would really want the ability to, um, you know, there were just like little things. I, I wanted to have some like normalized positions. I also wanted to be able to know like the velocity of my hands or like the distance between my hands. So I just kind of tried to set it up out of the box so that you could have uh, a lot of these pieces just ready to go. And I'm kind of calculating those things for you. So you can see here, like I have the um, velocity of my left hand and just with some like easing and things like that applied to it, and also like the distance between my hands, um, with also some nice little mappings too. So like for example, if the the score of my hands dips below a certain threshold, it'll just default to zero. So you can kind of customize all of these things on the fly, um, but also it supports multipose. So you can easily swap the model to to either do single or multi-person tracking. And um, from there, you can go in and uh, it'll just pick it up the same way. So this is our player one, player two. Uh, and I also have it set up as well so that you can either like render it out with the single person or multi-person. Um, but my goal was like, how can, I, how can I just like have kind of a standalone component that people could just use for body tracking? Uh, not have to pay for a connect, <laughs> just kind of like uh, use it out of the box. And it's been so fun too, because I actually ended up uh, passing this along to a lot of my students to test out with. And we've been doing a number of projects, just kind of playing around with uh, TD Ableton and setting them up with this component so that they can um, play around with the body tracking, but also kind of like build out their own interactive installations as well. Um, so that's been that's been super, super fun. And uh, See if I can demo this little. I also did like a quick little visual setup. I just wanted to see, just to be able to show what that would look like. There should be some audio going through.
So in theory, I just put like a little low pass filter on it or high pass, low pass, <laughs> I always get it mixed up. Uh, but yeah, I'm just tracking the distance to my hands right now. Questions. <laughs> it's on. You, you might have addressed that. That's really cool, by the way. I can imagine using that. Um, <clears throat> why the web sockets? Is it because you wanted it in the browser, or I, maybe I missed that bit? Um, so. I initially tried using, like, I, I actually ported it initially into a script top or a script chop. And um, yeah, it only ran on the CPU, so super slow. I was running it on, like, a like a maxed out Alienware computer, and I was getting, like, 30 frames a second. And I was like, this is ridiculous. Um, so yeah, MoveNet, the machine learning model was trained specifically for mobile uh, or for the browser. And so basically, the only way to get it to run at full frame rate was to just run it in the browser. And it, behind the scenes, it's using TensorFlow.js. Um, and from there, I needed some way of basically trying to get that data into Touch Designer as fast as possible. Um, so WebSockets felt like a great approach to that. And for this one as well, I'm, I'm using like a local TD's built-in WebSocket server as well. Um, for like a previous implementation, I had set it up so that you're kind of hosting your WebSocket server. Um, on a you know like a Heroku server or something like that, and what's fun about that is that you could pipe your uh, pose data over the internet, so you could be in a completely different location. But for this project specifically, I wanted to just have it kind of set up for an installation, and um, you know everything's local. You don't actually need Wi-Fi in order to use it, uh, and you should just kind of start up out of the box. So it's in the browser, but, but all Greg, can wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. I need to have a question. <laughs> so it's in. It's it's in the it's in the browser, but it's all local on your machine, including, totally. including MoveNet and everything. Yeah. So what I ended up doing is I I have the um, I I was trying to get everything like stored into uh, text stats to just import. The only thing that I wasn't able to like bring in directly into TD were the actual machine learning models because they're like .bat files. Um, but basically, I, I like reworked, like recoded a bunch of pieces in the website so that everything is uh, local dependencies, so that you can just open up the project and everything is stored. Uh, and then it's loaded in the web browser. And it'll also do some other things, too. Like I needed to be able to sync the webcam. Um, but you have different IDs that are in the browser versus what's in Touch Designer. And so I even uh, I was able to use, there was a great little a little snippet that showed this this abstraction to like build out the menus. So uh, when the website first connects, it'll it'll prompt and figure out what webcams are available, and then you can you can just select them here in Touch Designer, and it'll it'll auto switch it for you. Hi. Uh, yeah, great work. Thanks. Uh, curious about this project f you made for MIT Museum. Uh, you said that you used some, again, like machine learning algorithms. Yeah, for that. And interesting, like, what data did you use for that? Like, what for you trained this machine learning model, and what did you try to generate? With it? Sure. Um, I, so I kind of, for this project, I kind of came in to do, I would say, like, more visual polish on on this. So. I think uh, Brian Ma would have some some more like details about that behind the scenes. But so basically, the the images were based on the collection from like the MIT archive. So they had the collection of all all the different images from that archive, and then the model. It might have been something like TSNI or uh, like UMAP or something similar to kind of like do a dimensionality reduction. And the idea is that you have like clusters of similar images, essentially. And so what they would do is uh, we kind of set up the project so that it would like 
all, you know, all the images in the whole archive are kind of just like laid out by similarity. And then over time, it'll just pick a random point on uh, in that set of images. And then it'll kind of grab the nearest like 10 or 15 images, bring those in, but it also will grab text as well. And so from there, um, it'll kind of cycle through a number of different animations. So you saw like one version where like the whole project turned sideways and you had text scrolling down in the background. So that's where the text was brought in. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I think for the, the algorithm, honestly, it kind of reminds me of like the Rafik Anadol piece a little bit, um, but non-particle based. <laughs> like I feel like this one is a bit clearer about like what's, what's being displayed or, or what it's sampling under the hood. So we could, you know, if we wanted, we could turn it into a Rafik piece. Uh, if we, we just took this same, same thing and then made a particle system out of it. Uh, dear friends. <laughs> Yeah, we also got a question from the stream. Um, will you share all of this? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> which uh, which part? <laughs> the uh, this. Uh, so yeah, for the the this connects piece, uh, I'm going to launch this very very soon. Uh, but yeah, so right now it's dependent on a fix in the newest build of Touch Designer. Um, this will work on every computer, I think, in the previous version of TD, uh, except for an M1 Mac. So there's a, a new fix that'll get this running on uh, any of the M1 or ARM-based Macs. So I think once that's out, then I'll, I'll record a, a demo and uh, fix up the, the new bug that we just discovered today <laughs> with, the, with the render, the uh, single, single player render. Yeah. <clears throat> No more questions? All right, then. Thank you very, very much, Torin. Cool. Thank you. OK, next up we have Florence Toe. But how much time do we have uh, in between, Stefan, or Wieland, or? 30 minutes. 30 minutes. OK, we have uh, bananas, coffee, water, Club Mate, beer. <laughs>
Okie dokie. Okay, guys, I think we're going to start, so uh, grab your seats. Thank you. I'm really very, very excited about our next presenter, Florence Toe, who is joining us, uh, obviously, from Germany, but prior to that, the UK. Um, Florence is an artist and director in the fields of motion graphics, sonography, sound, and light installations with a focus on architectural spatial design. Uh, also a background in textile and tailoring. Interesting. Uh, she merges her skills with digital technologies, developing installation in disused spaces, taking advantage of a structure's defects. Lots of res residencies and commissions uh, include the Berliner Fetzspiel, uh, STRP Eindhoven, Mass Mocha, Massachusetts, which I've been to, uh, Photonics Group at the International Iberian Nanotechnology Lab in Portugal. So the um, for, the, for the presentation, Florence will give us some insights into her design methodology and research on spatial environments and semantics, as well as how she constructs narratives with digital tools. Thank you, Florence. Hi, um, my name is Florence Toe. Um, I've been working in this field since 2008. Um, I work as an artist and director for the last 15 years, and I'm going to be talking a lot about design theory. I'm not going to put too much focus on the, like, the, how, how I use digital tools, but more about the concepts driven from it. Um, I work in different modalities, and as mentioned before, I worked in textiles and tailoring, which is what I studied. Um, I changed my medium in 2008 when recession hit, economical recession, and started working with digital tools um, because working on textiles and tailoring wasn't as sustainable as, as I thought I could make it. And of course, living expenses isn't really you know, managed so well. So these are some of the works I produced um, since 2008, and uh, working with light, sound, um, most of it started abandoned spaces, and um, I ended up researching more into psychoacoustics and understanding the interconnection of vibration as a universal medium. Um, so um, even though I use various tools, including the amazing application touch designer, um, I'm, to make the work I do functional, the roots of the concept and developing design theory practice keeps the consistency and agency of the de decisions I make. Um, so I'm going to introduce a bit more practice, um, building light sculptures, projection mapping, and damp underground raves, which is how I started. Um, I was um, finding spaces in Glasgow, where this is where I came from, Glasgow, and in London, um, which were had much bigger spaces. And in 2008, there were a lot of abandoned spaces, so I was able to pitch ideas and gather equipment and um, learn how to work with tech tools and understanding how to do multiple projection mapping and also understanding how to use um, materials, but also how to use this material sustainably. Um, I investigated the presence of light and sound with um, physical materials in disparate environments and also understanding the phys physical, phys sorry, psychological triggers and cognitive emotional behaviors and architectural space. Um, so these are the pictures of more of the works I've done in um, opera and theater, in, in museums, and also with uh, the Photonics Lab in, in Braga in Portugal. Um, my, I'm just, I end up kind of self-teaching myself a lot of the work I did, um, especially with light and also cognitive emotional behaviors and um, understanding how frequencies play their part in spaces. And frequencies can be in light, it's in color, it's, it's everything. You know, I don't really see like light and sound separate, I see everything together. Um, and uh, so this led me to explore the basics of light techniques and the history of light perception and understanding human visual system processes and information. Um, it's not only focusing on logical systems, but also trusting how the mind analyzes and as a receptor of experience and also investigating optical processes in relation to sound and frequencies and vice versa. 
Um, so I'm like running through this because I think I got went a bit OCD in this presentation, so I'm not sure I'm gonna fit it all in in like 45 minutes. So uh, tell me if I'm going too fast. Um, I'll move on to the example of visual development. Um, so I came across this when I, I guess like, after 2008, when I wanted to understand more about visual developments and understanding how the eye receives information. Um, I came across this uh, theory by Dante, medieval philosopher poet, and it opened up my awareness to how you know, we use geometry in a way of connecting to contrasting elements and emotional behaviors, but understanding cognitive theory in shapes and textures, as well as how we define multiple elements and layers of inf as information. As you can see, contrast and harmony, instability, balance, asymmetry, symmetrical, fragmentation, unity, irregularity, regularity, and so on. Um, and then I started learning about eye movements and how we see, receive information in terms of details, like dots, lines, and how lines move. Um, I actually, a lot of my research came from older theory, and even though science is always changing, technology is always changing. To be honest, the information, even though they're romanticized in the medieval ages, they were very much based on vulnerability of information. So even though it's not statistically or like proven that this is exactly how this works, in a way it still makes sense because it's how we describe, it's how we use words or how we visualize, and they all have play a part in this role in history. So I want to understand how the eye was working and how people theorized how we see movement, especially with spirits and eyes in the brain. Um, uh, and learning about how long we can respond to our visual perceptions and sound together, working with positioning of light distance and sectioning on multiple reflective surfaces, focusing on the idea of dark adaptation and how it contrasts with light movements and illumination, which can heighten our senses, and how sound reflects on repositioning of light on each um, in the picture. You see these panels. These are optical. I think they were polarized optical panels, and so when light hits these, it did turn white, but when there's no light, it goes back to black. Um, and here, I want to show you this diagram of uh, some of the early drawings of the eye. Um, uh, this is a medieval mathematician, astronomer, and physicist uh, from the Islamic Golden Age, um, Ibn al-Haytham which was the first, he was the first to explain that vision occurs when light reflects from an object and then passes to one's eye. And to argue that visual vision occurs in the brain, pointing to, to observations that is subjective and affected by personal experience. Ibn al-Haytham based his theories on the work of the philosopher and physician Galen, who believed that the origin of the visual pathways was located in the interior ventricle of the brain, where the animal spirit could interact with the visual spirit borne by the optic nerves. Eventually, cell theory and other discoveries rendered this idea obsolete. And here you can see light emission theory, um, and the old theory emissions from the eyes to the object, extra mission. For example, vision occurred when light issued from the eyes, the ray leaving the eye. And intromission theory, which is emissions from the objects to the eyes, receives the particles which flow fence from it. And by understanding these basic theories, you start to see light in a different way. And if you see light as a spirit, like how it passes through and how we receive, but it's even an example would be if you were the animal spirit and you were, and your computer's the visual spirit, you know, you receive, you see the information that you're programming in a computer and then it receives back to you and then you make a decision of what to do next. And this is a kind of a more vulnerable way of seeing how to process information, but also understanding how to create geometries in space and then how in a design aspect, how if you want to create more behavior aspect between a person and the content you're making, like how do you create an interaction which the human has more control over, the, over like how they perceive the behavior of the visual spirit. Um, and this is an example from a residency from um, Iberian Now Technology Lab, which I did in Braga. Um, it was working with photonics. It was an, um, I was working with a physicist who was actually developing a, quite a unique um, research uh, using AI for optical computing. He was trying to create a sustainable computer where he used AI um, to, res to understand how photon receptors could create nanotechnology uh, to develop computers um, in the optical realms because um, 
light waves are more efficient than electrical waves. Um, and here you can see. And in this uh, animation, I was researching how um, light energy, how it reaches the cones of the eyes, and how the study of light, light behavior when detecting form and color in photonics. As using the light, the eye is the physical receptor of light energy and is focused on color object, light passes through the retina in the back of the eye where the photosensitive cells convert the light energy into different nerve impulses, which also op so as uh, optical conductors semiconductors that use light waves to transmit and receive information. And uh, I, during this residency, I, I built an installation which, with lasers and um, this uh, animation, which is it's just technically a stop motion animation using different color waves, but there is actually, there's no effect in this animation at all. It's literally using different, two different oppos opposition of colors to develop effects. Um, here's more examples, uh, understanding how light distance with colors um, and transmits materials and how they stop light. So you see this is, these are clear transparent mater materials and at the end I use red to stop the beam of light passing through. Um, and this is an example of uh, how I was understanding how the wave behaviors were working in terms of transmissive materials and how to position the light in space. <laughs> Um, and this is a diagram of one of the scans I made of the pillars that was to receive photons. Um, sorry, this is quite vague because I did this a while ago, so this I had to like f dig out some scans of uh, some of the research I did. But understanding how the how many photons could we be received in pillars, and pillars it was it was like a, a nanofabrication of how they make circuit boards, and I was understanding we did actually even. I think we managed to get one photon, but the research was so early. Um, actually, I don't really know how the, the physicist I worked with if, if managed to make a, the, the smallest mini optical computer. I'm not really sure if he did or not. Um, and uh, yeah, this is the installation in Braga, uh, which is like a become, it became a playground of sense and vision, observing techniques to demonstrate the space where the research takes place. Because when I was doing the research residency, I was working with um, lasers and positioning of, of light beams to scan. It was all about scanning and using different um, scanning techniques, which is using different color wavelengths and wavelength propagation. And this also, this, so I built this installation to demonstrate um, where space and research takes place and also theory and process and also emotional memory, which merged from the environments of the laboratory. And in the previous video, there was sound that which came from machines. So I record the sounds of when I was doing nanofabrication um, of the residency. Um, and here you see, this is a, a still of the one of the animations. And they're spinning so fast, it ends up looking like there's a hole in the screen. But they're actually, this, this, this is not, the image you see isn't really there. It's actually layers of the set of like two opposites of colors, and then the speed end up taking place that create this new color. But you see it in the eye, but actually when you pause it, it's not there anymore. Um, and next is this installation I made. Um, it was working with um, data of Earth and Venus resonance. And I'll explain a little bit later why I use those both planets. Um, the installation is composed of 12 notes taken from the scale that makes up Earth and Venus residence. The intention was to show a slow, playful environment. And in doing so, I was researching psychological ways to encourage a less intellectual environment where the participant can feel at ease, become vulnerable, and are encouraged to listen to each other. And this uh, installation took place in Resonate Festival in Belgrade, and at the time when they asked me to get involved, I wanted to build an installation where people could not, could disappear. They could like leave the conference room and go somewhere and spend time playing in this room. But also uh, the noise would be filtered out where you feel like you're by, you're, you can be playful and you don't have to consume too much information and you, and you have somewhere to escape to. And the intention of doing this uh, was to find psychological ways to encourage a less in intellectual environment where the participants could feel at ease, vulnerable, and encourage them to listen to each other. Um, and here, the reason why I chose these two planets, it wasn't for astrology reasons. Um, Venus is actually 
Earth's twin. They were born the same, around the same time, and they are built the same material. And, uh, but they both went in two different directions. And uh, eventually, they, went, they both became two different planets, because uh, eventually, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> I'm speaking too fast. Um, I can show you the, yeah. So uh, the frequencies were based on data readings from 1952 and 2017. The peaks of the extremely low frequency within the Earth's magnetic field spectrum is also known as Schumann's resonance. Um, in, in 1952, Schumann's resonance was built, measured at 7.83, and in 2017 at 36.70. And this was quite high, and it was the highest it was ever measured. And I made this installation in 2017 because I was curious to understand why this was. So I ended up getting Venus and Earth's resonance, and I merged them together, and I made 11 tones. And those tones become harmonics. In this diagram, you see the first, second, and third harmonics. When these waves play together, they build an entire frequency. And in these frequencies, the reason why, for example, you go to nature, you want to feel like you're at peace, because at nature, you actually have the most similar Schumann's resonance you can have. Because there isn't like any microwaves, um, frequencies flying around you. You actually feel there's less noise. I mean, yeah, some people feel it, some people don't, but the bees definitely feel it. <laughs> and uh, so I, this ended up becoming a, a project, a passion as well, where I want to understand better about how even with these frequencies we can't listen to, or if we feel them, what happens to us. Um, and uh, which is why I, I want to talk about multiplicity. A lot of the work I do is very, in a way, it's, it's, it's more, it is kind of objective, but it's also subjective in a way, because I don't try to put information on people. I rather, rather they feel, rather than me give them information of me telling them how they feel. Because, in that, because I think humans lose our agency by thinking that because this is, this is true, it means we should feel this. But to be honest, when I started working with digital tools and technology, a lot of the questions I had was, if this is true, then why does it not feel like it is? And by my own, my own perception, so sometimes I question, so if you don't, can't feel that, or the person, the participant can't feel it, then is the data true? So then I ended up thinking more about emotional cognitive, cognitive behaviors and how to give more agency to the human, um, which is why I have a design driven practice that cultivates cl continuous fluid responses to the changing present, but also uh, um, dismantling ideological conditions of social and cultural apparatus. Sorry, okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and now it's like, sorry, what, what time is it? Okay, I'm doing okay. <laughs> um, so I can slow a lot down. Um, and this is, a, this is an old book I had. Um, uh, oh my god, I thought I wrote down where it's from, but I haven't, sorry. Uh, and I, it's about uh, syntax systems, and it's about solving visual problems. And this is kind of relational to um, eye movement, um, even though it doesn't strictly say that. It's about visual literacy. So even with uh, visual systems, when I mean like text-based work, they end up becoming geometry as well. When you see um, like the alphabet and you can combine the alphabet as uh, pixel resolution, it's kind of the same as syntax. And you can use visual literacy uh, to combine forms and phrases and sentences, and you can create rules in, in your geometry work. And uh, syntactical potential structure in the visual literacy system is an investigation of the process of human perception. And if you think about how we learn information, you think about how humans learn when they enter the world, they see they're very sensitive to geometry and they're sensitive to words too, but they're learning as they, as they get older. And if you think about how we frame knowledge in a universal sense, like you think about how we interpret knowledge as we get older, because every frame base that we grow up in, especially in schools, dictate how we interpret knowledge and how we see people and how we see the environment. So I later on went on to uh, working with text, and this is one of the, um, some of the pieces I worked on last year, which is actually still a, a work in progress. Um, this is a real-time audiovisual performance using text and voice. I, would work, I started working on this with um, Felicia Atkinson, a sound artist, um, and we started writing a story together and creating a sound and generative topography work. 
and she's French, so we use some of the French text and translating some of our fictional text because we, during the story, we wrote, we wrote, wrote about how we thought about about data and about our um, archives and how they develop over time, and also how they get buried. So it was also about how to create like a, a digital composition which could be archived, but also archived in a way where text-based work it can tell a story even if it doesn't make sense, but the words all relate to each other. And also using um, uh, uh, traditional Chinese and Oracle Bone Script, and Oracle Bone Script is the second iteration of the Chinese language. It's like hieroglyphics um, and uh, understanding how these relate and how they overlap. But even though the people might understand it, it's also about creating like a dialogue on how people can interact with something they may or may not understand, but what senses come out of this. And uh, so like the voice, she would tr her voice would trigger some feedback scripts. Um, and uh, I, I created timers, but also like how I would also control the live and how the, what, what players would come through. Um, and uh, yeah, I will develop this later this year again. Um, I'm quite interested in the etymology of linguistics and also like how I could create a, in performance, not just using geometry, but also working with um, text-based work. Uh, is this a, I think this is a small example. Maybe it's I have many layers but you can't really hear it. where I could be either literal, metaphorical, and reimagined. Notes a conversation between archive and radical, questioning their personality and relations. To their purpose. Okay. And then, oh, oops, sorry. And then you see more of the work. I'm developing this um, working with a Chinese voice, spoken voice later this year, but also working with um, bird sounds, <laughs> bird syntax. And uh, so I'll be doing some residencies to move this further and to have more time with it. And I also wanted to show you some of the, the scripts. So this is a poem I made based on one of my animations. Um, it was a video I made called Lucen um, during pandemic. And I also showed that STRP Eindhoven. And this is the Chinese script, which is then converted to Oracle von script, just to, so you can see the iterations uh, it went through. And I am going to end it with this, I think, how long is it? It's a, a video. So. Um, Sorry if I spoke too fast. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. You're welcome. Did you write it? I wrote it, yeah. Thank you. The visual um, next is it's about that. Tautological is it's interesting that word because that was the hardest word to convert to Chinese. Um, it's a it's a repetitive system that dives deeper, so it's, it can be explained in mathematics. They use the word for mathematics, but it also can be used in, I mean, in terms of like how to say urban lingo. I think tautological systems can be also used as a deep loop as well. Like Sorry. Like no, it's it's like a repetitive system, like pattern repetitive. Uh, but it's like a, I, I don't know if I just made this word up, like deep loops. It's a loop, but it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. Yeah, that's the only way I can explain it. But I think there's like a mathematical equation of ontological systems as well. Okay. And yeah, you can see this one.
Thank you. <laughs> Has anyone got any questions? Oh, hang on. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, uh, I was wondering, you talk a lot about physical uh, experiences, like the frequency of nature, uh, and how that resonates with us. Uh, and you make works which are uh, 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 digital. Do you have any problem like translating, or does the, the digital world hold up to the physical experiences you are researching? I think um, I repeat a lot of the methods I use to the point where I try to understand um, for example, the theories I use, like do they measure up? And I think most of the time, if I speak to people or interactions, like they tell me an information that I'm not aware of, I'll tend to go a bit deeper and add that layer into, the, into that. Like the harmonics became a big part of my work after that um, installation with the, the resonance, um, with the, the pipes, because there were a lot of people that gave me their experiences of what would happen to them because um, a lot of time I try to time out people to be in, that, in a space for like 15 minutes. Um, I try to figure out how to keep them there by either changing the, the visual, the, the light aspect. So like say you're, you're playing with the pipes, ladies use Elon as an example. Um, like, and say they get bored, the light changes and they're like, oh, what's happening? They'll stay again, they'll play more pipes. So I try to find a way if they say 15 minutes, I've done my job. If they haven't, then I have then, you know. <laughs> because your senses don't react for more than eight minutes, actually. And mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was a lot of tests were done that, that people find difficult for people to keep that, that assist the brain to react to information. It stops reacting after eight minutes. Um, the brain gets tired, and it doesn't absorb anything anymore. So it, it's interesting for me to know how I can keep people react, brains reacting without them knowing. Okay. Um, hi. Um, can you explain? Um, I'm always asking, asking the geeky questions. Um, you, the, you, your kind of workflow and how you compose those images using nodes and touch designer? Because <laughs> uh, it's, it's uh, fascinating. And I'm always trying to figure out like what, what, they're nav what, you, what the artist is navigating and, and putting together to make, make images. And, I, I think it's, for example, Lucen that went through so many iterations of every software. <laughs> I made that for three years. It went through three, three or four iterations. And with Touch Designer, they play, play the big part in feedback and displacement. But then adding it on top over and over again. And then when I finish all the effects, I cut it up and I clean it up. Um, but I do it by hand. I don't do it through software or or working with the nodes to take pink things away. I actually manually cut them out. So uh, I actually think this gives me, makes me more control. For example, in the Lucent, you saw the red. I had to cut out so much of that content to put the red in there. I manually added the red in there. I had to mask like more than like 6,000 frames or something like this. Um, but that's what COVID does to you. It gives you more time. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the text-based stuff, actually, I really like touch design for text, typography work. I think there's so much potential. Um, so that's why. And it's hard for me to actually have time to spend on my computer, because as you see, I, I work with so many different types of places, but I also work as a director. So most of the time, if I don't have a person, a collaborator, a technologist, I have to try to do it myself. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's the, the hard fact of like, sometimes when you work in a field, you just need to do it yourself, right? And I'm the person that, if I have a good workflow, I understand how I'm putting elements together, I can generally figure it out. Uh, but you really have to have a workflow to, find, to figure out how to put things together. Is that okay? Answer? Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> hey, uh, I was wondering, um, in regards to your your work with resonance and and many of the other things, if you ever found it particularly challenging to keep certain audiences engaged, um, as in, you know, there's there's a lot of diverse people. I'm wondering if you found 
consistent results with with some kind of universal things like you know the harmonies or or whatnot um usually the when i exhibit a piece of work it's usually in a very dark cave type place and so i think a setting is always helpful but also it's the information you give that person so i tend to not give them too much information of where they're going to and that leaves an element of surprise. If I'm going to tell them, I'm going to give you resonance, I'm going to give you harmonics, <laughs> you're going to feel like drone. Um, I'm not going to tell them that. I'm not going to tell them it's another drone piece. Um, but sometimes like, I do feedback. So with the, the pipes, I actually recorded each pipe. And I actually had a low resonance feeding through the space without them knowing. So when they would play with the pipes, a, a new harmonic would enter because there was already a low frequency coming through. And then they'd be like, oh, what's happening? And then, uh, then because the pipes were in different positions, sorry, I should have explained this earlier. There was, I should have said, and the pipes, they were all positioned based on body perception. So uh, towards the floor, above, and in front. And this created a different timbre. And also a different way of hitting. And actually, I learned a lot from hitting installations that uh, people would like to hit really hard. <laughs> so there was one person that was very drunk and tried to break the installation because they were like, oh, this is fun, and started hitting the pipes. Um, but also, it's also a play of strength. So having trust in the audience to use their strength, but also to know how they playful, to play sounds. And uh, for them, it's like, oh, you just you trust us in playing these pipes. Um, this is also a good way of talking about it. It's like, how do you get the audience, audience to trust you? Like, how do you know like the audience trusts them to be smart enough or to be able to be vulnerable enough to like, okay, I, this is what I get from it, you know? Is, is, it, is that enough for your question? Yeah. Okay, great. Could you say something about your interest in this Oracle Bone script oh, or something? Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so I, my native heritage is Hong Kong. And uh, when I was a kid growing up, uh, like, I, I mean, I had a single parent, so she couldn't teach us Chinese. And uh, I, eventually I did go to Chinese school, but I was too old. I was like a teenager, and it was like every Saturday. And through the work I'm doing, I'm also trying to learn Chinese again. And learn, but learning it from 301, like, 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 like when the Oracle Bone script was made, um, it was like, uh, it's basically nature characters. It's like hieroglyphics, it's about nature. It has birds in there, there's pots in there. And it's funny, because when you see Chinese now, it's so refined and so clean. It wasn't that clean before, it was all swiggly lines. And um, I wanted to show like how ancestral heritage plays a part in language. And uh, even though I can't really completely read it, I have friends, my other uh, Chinese friends be like, oh, I can read that. I, can, I, can, I know where that is, I know where that is. So it actually hasn't, people can still understand how these characters are written. And I wanted to show like an, an, an ancestral heritage to like where I come from. And also scarred landscapes because scarred landscapes about migration. It's about, um, you know, how our climate is dissolving. It's about uh, evolution. Um, it's all about also people as textures. So uh, yeah, that's, that's the reason why I used it to, to create a story. I don't know how to ask it properly because there's just so much information going through my head right now because <laughs> everything is so interesting. But uh, at the beginning, you um, there was a text that spoke that you work with uh, emotion and healing through your work. So I'm interested in, in knowing if there is, okay, let me, let me think about it. Because um, uh, how can I ask this? That makes sense. Um, first of all, what, what inspired you to actually um, do this with people? Because it's a thing, you, you're doing it collectively, right? You're, you're making this installation and it has an impact on people. So how do you know exactly what effect it has on them? And how, um, how long did it take you to get there, right? Okay. Um, well as we all know, it's all trial and error all the time. <laughs> um, I think, oh God, uh, I could, I mean, I'm gonna start from 
the bare bones, uh, like working like at raves, dance spaces, from how I started. And so you think about these dance spaces and how these harmonious collectives arrive in these spaces to be together, right? And then when I started doing work more focused on specific detail, harmonics in a way has, the thing is of harmonics, it can also be called drone, right? And we've all heard drone. But it's also about how these frequencies reach your cells. And with Schumann's resonance, is in theory, uh, when human cells were born, um, there's a theory that maybe the resonance of Earth is what, is what created these magnitudes of cells to come together. Which is why like, I use those frequencies uh, to understand better how it feeds through the microscopic cells of our bodies. But it has to be in a vulnerable sense. I can't really... Um, the more inf information, the more narrative you give a person in terms of language, the more they choose what to perceive and what the information they're given. It's like reading a book about a book that tells you this is not a true story, but you think it's true. Your brain tells you it's true, but it's not true. So um, all I could just trust is if someone feels something, and if I speak to people, um, I'll tell them, like, I won't tell them anything. So that's the only information you can get. I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm not going to tell you what this does, but tell me how you feel. And that's actually the most honest um, opinion you can ever have. And if you give them too much data, you can't really get the emotional impact. So it's always good to analyze that data from the first-hand experience and then develop it more. You're welcome. I have a quick question. You teach a lot by not specifically teaching, by letting people sort of teach themselves through your work. And I'm just wondering if you actually do any teaching. Like, oh. like. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's actually how I came to Berlin. I was teaching a lot here, like workshops with space, sound, and actually a lot of workshops I do, I try to teach them for the first days not to use a computer, to understand spatial proximities. Um, about working with what they already have in terms of their body. And I, I mean, when I mean body, I mean also with their voice, just to give them a voice at least, but also in a way where they can use their own languages, their own ways they see, they, how they see language. I don't think framing things in boxes is very helpful for creative tools. I think if you open up as much space for them, and also give them more agency in their framing of knowledge, then at least you give them something that has their own practice. I don't like to teach people about practices that I want to give them. I want to see what they give me first. And then I'll give them like a guidance towards that. Um, I feel like because when I grew up learning, um, I mean, I went to art school. I did, I did a, a master's in design in art school, but I also never went to art school. <laughs> and uh, uh, bypassed anyway. But at the same time, the, I didn't go because it was our ignorance. I actually just didn't feel I was learning enough, and I felt I had to teach myself a lot of the time to be able to find like ways I know, OK, this is what I believe in, and I can make this work. Because most of the time, when you're judged for critiquing your work if, by with mentors and professors, you're like, you're, they're guiding you in their way. But then I feel like I'm losing my way. Like I could have a way I could start with and then see if I'm right or wrong. Like who, are, who is anyone to decide that what I do is not the right way or wrong way? You know? And there needs to be that more of that vulnerability rather than trying to find an inherent connection that this thing is happening, so I'll do something that's happening the same way. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, thank you very, very much, Florence. That was uh, very evocative. Thank you. OK, so we have about 15 minutes before Martina Assum is going to present for us. So uh, there's still three bananas. <laughs>
I'm very, really happy to introduce Martina Assum here. Uh, she's the head of motion design and interactive development at Pool Group, uh, where she started writing her bachelor thesis at the lighting department and worked on site as a video technician creating motion graphics on the site. Um, I think during that time, then you also fell into touch designer. And uh, you specialize more and more in content production. Uh, she added the motion design department at Pool Group's company port or to Pool Group's company portfolio, and is due to her experience and focus the link between the creatives, programmers, technical departments, and stage directors. With Martina being a longtime developer and collaborator in the community, we're looking forward to hearing how Pool Group utilizes Touch Designer in the, the uh, company's project work. Thanks. Welcome, everyone. Um, yeah, I was about to say welcome to the rather dark side, corporate side of it right now. It's about Touch Designer at Pool Group. I think most of you here in the room might not have heard about Pool before. So we are not selling swimming pools. Uh, pool is, is a by now 45-year-old uh, full-service event production company. So if you go to our website, let's see, we got it on the wrong screen, of course. Then you see here that we have three main markets that we are serving. So it's touring and entertainment, corporate shows and trade shows, politics, unions, and conferences. Um, in general, you could say, we come into play either if they are big productions or quite um, important ones like G7 Summit here. Okay, but what is a full service event production company now? Um, it simply means that we have the technical departments like light, sound and video, but also the production coordination, the visualization and the creative concept. And the philosophy behind it is to have all those different parts together as one team to run events as smoothly as possible. So our product is not really a single touchscreen application or a video file that I'm rendering out. It's, it is rather the entire life experience. Yes, yeah, you just heard I started uh, as well in the lighting department with my bachelor thesis. I was lucky to work as a video technician on site on many productions because I specialize on media service and later on I got into touch. So I've been working with it since many years now and I would like to show you some of our projects. Here's an overview. Um, first, I will quickly show you some examples of how I'm using touch on an everyday basis. Um, before I will go further into detail with two bigger projects, you see it's Samsung IFA and the Talking Mona Lisa. You also see these are in 2017 and 2018. So why is it the first time now that you hear from them? It is simply because we had NDAs on both of these projects. Okay, I start with content production. I like to use touch for this because I'm simply faster with it. But I assume that most of you here know how to do this stuff, so I will ch just jump through it quickly. So these are just some snapshots from different openers, regular motion design. Um, we also do a lot of interactive installations, mostly touchscreen applications. i give you one example for this. Thank you. So here you actually see a print advertisement from EBV Electronic. It is a seller for electronic chips. And they had a campaign called the IoT Journey. So they made a pitch on how to transfer this key visual to a touchscreen application. And the task was they had three main groups of electronic chips, six to eight topics within one of those groups. And again, a lot of electronic chips uh, within one of those topics. So actually, 
you see the three levels here. It's uh, some kind of classic drop-down menu, you could say. But um, we came up with a rather 3D approach for it. So we translated the three main groups to three destinations, so spots within that city. And if you choose one, you go there with an orange line, simply because it's in the image. You see the orange streets. And if you, uh, if, when you arrive there, then you can choose between different houses. So the houses are the topics now. And then, furthermore, you can choose between different windows. The last image is just the design language of how to get to that point. Um, but you get the idea that you have a hierarchy of three different levels. Uh, the, le the destination, the house, the windows. And what I will show you now is a trailer rendered out of the touchscreen application because it would simply take too long to guide you through it all. And we have a look at it now. So here you see, here you see the IoT city. I'm going to talk all over it. It does not have sound. And as soon as you have chosen a destination, you go there with this orange line, see some important sponsors for it. And when you arrive there, then you see the houses which you can choose from, the topics. And if you double clicked on a house, it opens its windows. And from that point on, you could simply swipe up and down alongside the facet to open those windows. And you see the different chips now. Yeah, actually, this has been a trailer which is cut to a fast music, but due to licensing issues, you cannot hear the music now. But what is interesting about this was that all the contents that you have just seen were rendered in real time to be able to update them whenever you want to. How did you do that? You see a, a very simple folder structure here. You have the IoT footage. And here again, the three main destinations. So now you see here the houses. And for the security house, it had nine windows. And in the end, it all just came down to a simple text and a JPEG file. So you could simply exchange the files on the hard disk directly according to a template. OK, I also write some small but uh, quite useful tools with Touch Designer. One of these is a lower third tool. I think you all know what a lower third is because you know it from the news. It's this small animation at the bottom that shows the name and the description of the speaker. Um, we sometimes have events with like 30 to 60 speakers, and especially those description texts are changed several times. So it's quite a tedious work to do it over and over again, so I wanted to automize it. And now we simply send the client an Excel sheet that they have to fill, which you can see here. So it's simply a column with the names and a column with the descriptions. You need to save it as a text file so that Touch can load it in. But then you have it, and you see the names in there. If you press play, it plays the animation. At the bottom, you see a cut and fill output. If you continue playing, it simply goes down the Excel list. But you could also uh, select a specific name and jump there, maybe if the order has changed. Yeah, what you see at the bottom is, as I said, the cut and fill for those who are not familiar with it. If you have um, video signals like a DVI or HDMI signal, you cannot transfer the alpha channel. That's why you simply put an extra one, which only contains the alpha as a black-white image. And you could use this as a live tool, but um, by now we are mostly using it at the right bottom corner here, which is the export section 
that you can define a folder where you export to and the format. Mostly it's a QuickTime animation with an alpha channel. And then you can select whether you just export the current name or the entire folder. And of course, this entire folder export saves you a lot of time because all the files are now named and numbered according to the Excel sheet. And we can pretty much take the Excel sheet and put out all the files. Yeah, um, of course, you still need to adapt the design according to the client's corporate identity each time. So you have different colors, fonts, and so on. But in general, I would say lower thirds are quite similar. So we already have several templates, and this design animation process is also speed up like this. OK, so until here, we saw some examples of how I use touch on a daily basis. So it's really handy. Um, but as I said, I would like to go into further detail with two important projects. The first one is Samsung at the IFA here in 2017. Take a look at the team because a lot of those big projects are organized like this. So you have the client Samsung, you have Jail Germany as the agency, and Pool Group is the overall production. That means we are, are doing the entire um, booth at the City Cube, so the entire hall. And one part of it is, was the touch designer team with Keith, Itzer, and me. And our task was to do this uh, pretty big curved screen here, but, um, but not the nine photo station that you see in front of it. To explain it more in detail, I have a video from Chael. Unfortunately, it's only in German, but I will translate the most important features to you afterwards. Für die IFA 2017 stellt Samsung die Verbindung von Produkt und Mensch ins Zentrum der Markenwelt. Samsung, inspired by you. Um zu zeigen, wie wichtig Menschen für Konnektivität sind, wird ihnen allein ein Viertel der gesamten Ausstellungsfläche gewidmet. Eine multimediale Live-Installation begrüßt sie auf innovative Weise. Berührungslose Self-Scanner animieren die Gesichter der Besucher auf dem bislang größten Curved Screen der IFA. So würdigt Samsung die Menschen als Inspirationsquelle für Innovationen. Die räumliche Geste des Curved Screens zieht die Besucher förmlich in die dahinterliegende Produktwelt hinein. Für die ultra hochauflösende Bespielung sind 27 HD-Beamer auf 55 Meter freigespannter Rückprojektionsfläche ausgerichtet. Mehr als 250.000 Messebesucher konnten so ganz neue Blickwinkel auf die Marke gewinnen. Und über 14.000 Interaktionen setzten weitreichende Impulse in Social Media. Samsung, inspired by you. Die Installation, die jeden Messebesucher in den Mittelpunkt des Markenerlebnisses stellt. Okay. The key facts about it. Um, you had this interaction area right at the entrance, so it was the first thing that visitors saw when they came in. And all the products were behind it. So you saw other visitors live on the screen was kind of in the center of attention. And the screen was a 55 meter wide curved screen. You do this with a rare project projection with 27 HD projectors. As I said, there were nine photo stations with self-scanners. Um, they had connects inside to figure out how tall you are, where your face is. And there were, had been more than 250,000 visitors at the Samsung Hall at the City Cube and more than 14,000 interactions shared in social media. So it was quite a big success for them. And now we will enter the behind the scenes part on how to do something like this. First of all, 
We knew that for a 55 meter big screen, there will be many pixels. Here you see the previous setup in my office with the 27 HD screens. By the way, the first thing I did was go to IKEA and buy one of those wooden children shelves that you see on the right side here to be able to set up all those screens in three rows. But actually, the first thing that you do is to make a pixel mapping. And you see here, the 55 meters, they were about 15,000 pixels. Then you have those uh, colored areas. They are the graphic card outputs. And in between, you see these crosses. These are the overlaps that you need to make a soft edge projection. So they, the projectors are overlapped and then blend into each other. And in the end, it appears to be one big screen. So each movie had also be, uh, had to be split up into these sections. And we knew with 15,000 pixels, we would have to handle a massive amount of HEPQ data. So we also set up a 10G network in order to be able to do last minute changes. I don't know why we expected this. So for all those hardware specs, I was very lucky to have Itzar at my side. He planned the entire setup since we, have, we had to order all those machines. We had four computers, each with, a, a, each with two NVIDIA Quattro P5000 at that time, and a sync board to link them all together, and one big file server, all of them connected in a 10G network. So this hardware was a bit above what an average person would need and uh, what you would be willing to pay. So we knew that we have to play back very big Samsung advertisements that need to be in sync in order to appear as one big screen. But also there should be a live part with the photos that had to be rendered in real time. And we needed to get those photos from the kiosk to the screen really fast because people were standing there taking the picture and they could see themselves uh, almost directly on the screen before they left the spot, of course. Okay, so the next step is sync and real-time rendering. This was the very hard challenge to create a software that can do these actually opposite things. You only have one frame to sync all the 27 outputs on the one hand, and on the other hand, to render the real-time real content. At that time, we didn't even know what exactly the real-time content would be, because uh, the creative concept was still being developed. Uh, in the worst case, we knew it could be an entire particle system. So we needed to have a reliable software that could do both of these tasks together, and it had to be ready until the event. We were extremely lucky to have, I would say, a choker for this, and we brought him from Canada to Berlin. Here he is. This is Keith Lostreco at the IFA, together with some quite expensive computers next to him. And on the left side, you see the luminosity software running. So luminosity media server, he had already developed this uh, with touch designer before, so he could create a synchronized multi-chip view system. And we were very lucky that he was available for this job. And Keith programmed the entire show, which contained a playlist of the advertisements. This playlist was interrupted for the real-time part as soon as the photo stations had a photo ready. So not always at the same time. You had to wait for all nine stations until they had it ready. And they streamed it to our file server. We found out that it was faster to stream it than to exchange image files. In return, we also controlled the light rings via Artnet, so the hall was dark when the photos appeared on screen. In the end, we managed to keep the real-time task as simple as possible because we suggested to do the particles, as it turned out to be, so the worst case scenario. Um, we suggested to make them as already pre-rendered movies with alpha channel. And here you see 
the first test. So you have the particles. If this is running here. And underneath the photo. And we only had to blend the photo from top to bottom and the way back in sync to the particles. So with the particles on top, this actually created the illusion that it was all happening live. i show it again. So this was the magic behind it. But to the usual visitors, they of course figured out it would all be live there. So it was more data for us, but easier for the rendering. So in the end, I will remember this Samsung IFA project as quite challenging, but thanks to a bunch of really cool people, it worked out extremely smooth in the end. But now I will show you uh, the second project, which is uh, Mona Lisa and the BMW Intelligent Personal Assistant. It was for the Paris Motor Show in 2018. Client is the BMW Group. Our creative friends from Jung von Matt had the idea to bring Mona Lisa to life in front of the museum at Centre Pompidou in Paris. So people could ask her questions like to an intelligent personal assistant, and she would be able to answer in five different languages. So again, you see, Poole did the overall production, and this time it said was the lead programmer together with his team. Tim is also here. And the, the task was to transfer the face tracking of an actress live to the face of Mona Lisa. But first, let's have a look at the result. Bonjour de Paris. Innovations have changed the way we live. And thanks to the first ever BMW intelligent personal assistant, the intelligent voice control from BMW, I am finally able to introduce myself. Hello. This is me, Mona Lisa. People can ask me almost anything they want, and I have answers to almost all their questions. What's the meaning of life? Do you have a boyfriend? Can I take a selfie? Est-ce que tu aimes la Suisse? Why are you smiling? Ave Marie. Just like the first ever BMW intelligent personal assistant. Est-ce que la nouvelle BMW Série 3 peut, peut rouler de manière autonome? Oui. Elle marche en arrière. <laughs> BMW. Beaucoup. Monstre. Boum. Quand je peux acheter la série toi Rendez-vous à minuit à Notre-Dame. Okay. Now we did it. So, behind the scenes, the first part. How do you bring the world's most famous painting to life? You have to model her head. We had to model her entire head, not just the face, so she would be able to turn it around. And as you can see here on the right side, um, we knew that the hair would be some extra work. It's not just a bad hair day. And then the second step, making her smile. In order to make her smile and talk properly, she needed to have an add-on the original does not have, which is teeth. For its modeler David, this had been the first challenge to find appropriate ones. Then the plan was to move a face with a face tracking. Here you can see it said during the first tests. And remember it was 2018, so we did not have the NVIDIA face tracking job or any other AI available to do this job. 
it was all still research. So what we soon found out was um, we needed 70 so-called bones that you can see here in, in 3ds Max. That is uh, control points that change the surrounding surfaces. Each of them had a heat map. You see the colors according to how much it affects those specific areas. So we knew it is quite a lot of work to get it running. And now I will show you the first face tracking results. Please don't get scared of it. Yes, you see, this happens when you translate the face of the actress one by one to Mona Lisa's. It was this moment when we realized this task is much bigger than expected, and we had to find a way to keep Mona Lisa's decent, noble mimics. So at this point, it was rather scary and really creepy, but this was not the only problem. What scared us even more was we had another request on top of it. <coughs> Can she move more? In order to make her look human, our creative directors pointed out that Mona will look really strange if she only moves her head. Here you see what she was able to move. So indeed, her hands would always stay in place. Actually, the request even was, can't you make her get up from that chair? <laughs> so once again, I knew that Itzar and his team were having a huge research task ahead to create a decent Mona. Within the given deadline, you know, an event that you cannot postpone. And there was zero chance to put more pressure on them. So I was sitting there thinking about a solution for this. There was neither the budget nor the experts for a, to set up a motion capturing system. And not to even think about how we should render Mona's clothes in a proper way in real time. So in the end, everyone caught in a little bit of panic. I came up with this idea. You know, we had Itzat, uh, Itzat's face tracking that they were uh, working on. And completely separate from this, we needed to have pre-produced hand animations. I'll show you the first test. You see, we had to slightly move her arms a bit so she could do the gesture. So, after the new teeth and everything, now our Mona also got new arms and hands. Nevertheless, I was extremely concerned about our actress, Emmanuelle Collinet. She had to be able to answer in five different languages, which were English, French, Spanish, German, and also Italian. And all of this live, and all of this done as a direct improvisation. So as if this wasn't already enough now, there were more tasks for her. Here you see the container inside the LED cube that you just saw. And you see, she had to watch the live cam up here in order to be able to directly address people like, hey, you there in the red jacket. She had to be able to push some buttons in order to start and pause the live mode, which was on the screen making Mona Lisa fall asleep and wake up again. So these were also pre-produced sequences. And she had to read an already prepared PowerPoint. Uh, it was already translated in three different languages. It contained like general knowledge and of course the facts about the car. So whenever a question was asked that um, hit one of those 
answers here. Our creative director could jump to that slide. And he also had a little text window open to suggest some really cool answers via text. And last but not least, she had an in-ear, so we could directly talk to her. You see the microphone here. And what we actually, in the end, used to play back some songs in order to remind her of the melody and lyrics. But OK, so how should she now choose between different moves of her hands? I had to build some kind of user interface that would allow her to trigger those videos blindly without ever looking at it. So I did the following. I told the agency to define the six most important gestures that they wanted Mona to be able to do. Then I used the stream deck with six buttons. This where, was where the number six came from because I figured out this uh, is the maximum amount that you can simply distinguish while holding it in your hands. So it would, you would never have to look down and really choose a gesture. OK, so now let's have a look at a live recording we did on site to see how it all came together. D'accord, ça reste entre nous, t'inquiète. Bonne soirée. Hi, Gioconda. Hi, where are you from? I'm from Mexico. <gasps> you know Mexico? I love Mexico. Hombre, vamos hablando en mexicano. ¿Qué tal? Ah, ¿puedes hablar cualquier idioma? Pues algunos mejor que otros, pero sí, me encanta. ¿Eres del DF? Sí, de la Ciudad de México. Se escucha, se escucha. <laughs> ¿Puedes mandar saludos a los mexicanos? Con mucho amor, mando todos mis saludos y mi amor a México. Mm. Yes. Our Mona was quite charming and really, uh, quite charming and really flirtative <laughs> with everyone. It was not the scary Mona that you saw uh, from the start, since it said and Tim had found a way to restrict the influence from the actress to Mona's face. I think it was even depending on which mimic she was doing, but you can ask Tim here for further details of how the AI managed this. Here you see the interface. Um, don't pay attention to the sound, it's only background noise, but uh, take a look at the direct translation of the actress's face to Mona. So you can see the influence is really reduced to keep up that noble face that Mona should have. And one more here in front of the tower. So this was another example of Mona making dates. Mostly she wanted to meet somewhere in the evening in Paris to sell the new BMW. But now to the real question, what did all those people here ask? First of all, of course, a lot about the painting, her smile, and Leonardo da Vinci. Then a lot of requests for greetings and birthday congratulations, so everything that you could record and send to your friends and family. And there had even been an elderly man visiting the installation every day. I don't know why. And there had been kids giving her self-made paintings and put it in front of the LED tower. But most of all, people asked for songs. She was singing for the fewest, but also the fewest sang for her. So at some point, she even told the people that she is the Mona Lisa, not a jukebox. <laughs> but in general, she really enjoyed to sing, even songs like Macarena or some rap. And 
All in all, her charming and very warm-hearted way also made the visitors smile in return. So, to sum it all up, all the different steps that you saw, the modeling, the face tracking, the user interface, the gestures, all those really difficult technical challenges, in the end, they were just the preparation to provide the actress a powerful tool, which she turned into a character that people would love. So this was the real achievement in the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Martina. So who's got questions for Martina or the Mona Lisa? Hi, uh, I would like to ask about the Mona Lisa project. Uh, how was the process uh, to import the, the skin, the rig uh, from uh, uh, 3ds Max, the bone to touch the designer if uh, you encounter any problem, uh, if it was a difficult task? Uh, it was all in all, I would say, a, a really challenge to do that. But I was uh, not so deeply involved in this process because yeah. Itzad was doing it with his des designer team yeah. and with Tim. So I don't know the details about it, but of course it was kind of a fight to get it all done. And uh, later on as well to get the clothes uh, looking properly while she was doing the gestures. So these were all pretty heavy rendering tasks, I would say. Okay, thank you. I guess Tim could answer some questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you for uh, this talk. It was uh, super interesting. Um, simple question, I guess. Um, what was the time that you had for both of these projects from sort of, yeah, first um, pitch to delivery? Yeah, you, you usually hear the, hear the idea from the agency about like, two or three months before the event. But as you had seen at the Mona Lisa, we first were talking about like a comic Mona Lisa that you are all are used to from uh, television. And then it turned out, oh no, actually one, we want her to be like the real one. So the stakes were pretty high then suddenly and you have that given time frame. So it's, you could start earlier, but mostly the entire creative process involves so many people that I'm not sure if it would help. Probably we would just do more rounds of changes, but it's usually two and a half or three months before. Oh, I, I, I have a quick question uh, about the project with the, um, uh, with the washing machines and stuff, uh, mm -hmm. Samsung. Uh, how many pictures was there in the shaders that made the final faces? Actually, I like the idea very much because it is kind of uh, vivid that you, you need to make some, some human touch to, to all this you know, uh, equipment. Uh, but I, I just want some details. But the, um, the particles were produced by the company that also did the advertisement. So it was a, a, not a real-time rendering. So it was... But the portraits. The portraits, um, they were produced inside the uh, photo stations. So they were... It was a different company that did those stations. So they uh, transferred it to us and we d simply had to display them. We didn't have to create that image again. Cool, well I've got a question about the first project with like the city and the navigating stuff. Um, so I'm in data visualization, which you need to think about all these different metaphors for like abstract data. You say it's like a drop down menu, uh, like lots of data is also very abstract. Uh, and I really like the fact that you found sort of a physical metaphor for this, like navigating a city uh, and, and getting people to understand it. What I found when thinking about physical metaphors for data is that often uh, people don't really understand them. Uh, it's quite difficult to get them to, to follow your train of thought. Um, so I guess the, the question is, like, uh, did it work in the end? And how did you, did you try different meta metaphors for this? And uh, was um, it successful? At this project, I, I took rather the design approach because they had this IoT lady already, because I think the uh, guy who led the project really liked to have a lady with a body painting on it. But anyhow, so the IoT lady was set, 
And um, we took that design language, and then we just figured out how to make the structure. And of course, the houses had already been there in the key visual. Oh, uh, right, of course, yeah. yeah. And um, it was, uh, people were really, they were really amazed by the look it had in the end because nobody was expecting it. And um, it also contained some functions like statistics, so you could really um, read out which window was cl clicked how often. And yeah, it was received very well at that fair, yeah. Cool, nice. Yeah, I guess also the, the bar for sort of creative things at these very tech conferences is like if you make something really yeah, cool. Yeah, the, the point where it uh, changed a little bit for me was when they entered sh wanted to have shortcuts from one window to uh, yeah. another station. So uh, yeah. that made it, made it a little bit tricky, but uh, yeah, overall it was really received well. Cool, thanks. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about like the project with the big display, like how you got Touch Designer to, to drive such a large display with all the computers. Um, like I'm not even sure how one would go about setting that up, I'm just curious. Okay, so um, you, s you first make a pixel mapping, so you actually ask your colleagues from the video department, how many projectors do you think you will have there? And then they hand you over that first drawing, and then you, um, they are, we, we figured out how much data will it be, how big do the hard drives have to be, how much can one computer handle. And actually, Key's software is quite independent from the hardware side. You just define those nodes, the graphic cards outputs, and then you um, blend all those sections together. The hard part is really to keep it all in sync while at the same time rendering something which is taking away your little frame time that you have. And uh, so this really, really hard um, science behind it was already done by Keith. So in the Mona Lisa project, there's, <clears throat> there's a point in time where the, um, you're mapping the actresses movements to the characters, Mona's movements, um, I mean, you, you, you wanted to also limit the motion of the, uh, of Mona's head to not go into kind of cra crazy zone. So was there a the point in time where you're kind of fine tuning how, what those mappings are so you get, so she's still comfortable, um, not frustrated and can still express herself kind of thing? Um, yeah, we at that time we had worked with uh, video recordings from the actress, so she did not see the direct feedback already. We didn't have her in that process at that point of time yet. But I remember that Itzhar was working on it and he was really like, this is a hard one. Let's see how we get there. And uh, behind the scenes we also had a backup for the actress, so we had to do it twice. And that was uh, quite a lot of work to do. But in the end, um, as I said, I think Tim can give more detail about it. Uh, um, they restricted it according to which mimic it was doing. OK. Great, great presentation. So what do you think Leonardo da Vinci would think of your, your work? <laughs> and did you get to know the Mona Lisa better as a result of that? And what do you think of the painting now? Do you hate it or do you still like it? Or? Well, I have to say that this uh, children's painting I really liked a lot. <laughs> so yeah, of course we learned a lot about it, but uh, our actress tw really twisted it in a uh, up-to-date a Mona Lisa that could really handle those use as well there, whatever jokes they made, or yeah, she she could really deal with them. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. It was very nice, I think. Um, working with clients of this magnitude, do you have any space to for like artistic freedom, or are you straight developing from this point? We have a range, I would say. If you have, like you saw, the, the touchscreen application, um, in this case, we could do the creative concept entirely, so you can really um, be quite free to show things. 
And um, we also work together with uh, creative agencies a lot. So here's rather you, you get the task and then you figure out how to get there. And for me, it's always, yeah, you get the point. We want Mona Lisa to be human-like. So how can you do that? How do you get to that point? It's not about thinking in technical terms. Oh, we need to order a motion tracking system. No, it's about how do we get the message over? And it's more about understanding what they are planning to do. Yeah, so you have a certain range in any case. No more questions? Okay, thank you very, very much, Martina. <laughs> so now we have our lunch break, and uh, there are some very delicious looking um, things set up in the back. So uh, it's also a very sort of small space, so I guess we'll have to uh, figure it out. <laughs>
Okay. Check, 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 check. Okay. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. And it's my great pleasure to introduce these guys, Roy and Tim Gerritsen. Um, so basically things all began in, with a Commodore 64 in um, the late 80s, I believe. And that sort of like sparked your interest in all things technology and computers. And, uh, and then you sort of embarked on your own digital journey and kind of went on separate tracks. And then fortunately for us, that track converged and uh, Y equals FX sort of sprung from that. Um, so you specialize on, well, multimedia experiences that fully embrace contemporary technology and research. So in this talk, um, we're going to learn about uh, uh, how you navigate the landscape of technology and creativity while creating generative parametric objects. <laughs> I'm reading because <laughs> I'm digesting. <laughs> and uh, with a very research-driven uh, approach. So I'm just going to hand it over. What about all the raves they did? And all the raves you did, which is coming up. So <laughs> thank you. Hi. Hi. <laughs> so I'm Tim, and uh, this is Roy. We're from uh, YFX Lab. And uh, we're going to talk about um, a few projects we did and how we use a research-driven approach in our studio. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so we are a small studio. We have four full-time people. Uh, we founded in 2018 with Rogier. It's also here. Three of us uh, run the studio. And uh, last year, Max joined also the studio. Um, but we're really open working on with a lot of people. Uh, half our team is here. Um, yeah, so our background is in, in raves. We did a lot of uh, electronic music uh, parties. This was last year in the uh, Amsterdam Arena. Um, but now we want to talk a bit more about our installation-based work and mostly how we keep the fun in things and how we keep exploring, because that's the most part, like learning new things. Yeah, so we're first going to show you a little video about a, a project we did called Remastered. <laughs> so uh, Remastered is uh, an uh, experience center uh, with uh, multiple rooms. And one of the rooms we want to, to, to dive a little bit in deeper uh, is uh, the fish room. Oh, excuse me. And it's, um, uh, it's an, envi of an uh, immersive environment where we have uh, all walls projected with, uh, with a lot of projectors and created a 3D environment in Touch Designer and uh, including some uh, LiDAR scanners, which are depth scanners uh, by laser, to be able to um, detect when people touch the wall, and some Kinect uh, sensors on top to detect where they walk. So the LiDAR uh, interaction, again, Roy, the actor. Yeah, great <laughs> acting. <laughs> uh, there was <laughs> It was a bit tricky uh, to, to, to it was, yeah, the, the, we had a little bit of a, um, a challenge to, to make this work because uh, LiDAR is just detecting depth. So we had to convert the, the depth positions into a UV coordinate of the wall. And from there on, we had to convert the UV coordinate into our world. And since it's rendered perspectively, it was, yeah, quite doing the math to get it right, that the fish will uh, swim away where you touch. But in the end, it worked really well. Yeah. And uh, like now, I'm here alone, but normally like, there's 30 people there. And it, uh, yeah, yeah, per wall, there were 32 people that could touch it at once. And then the fish will uh, swim away. And also uh, some other assets we put in the world that were also interactive, like the, the plants. 
Another thing, oh, another thing we, uh, we research is the use of scale. Uh, we noticed that if you put a really big uh, fish inside, like a manta roh or a whale, you feel very small. And it was also funny that one of the reviews was like, uh, they really loved the, the way how we project the ceiling. But yeah, we, of course we didn't, we just projected on the walls, but they had the feeling that it was like above them. And a very big challenge was to, to make it work because we only had one computer and two uh, quadro cards, uh, which had to be synced, but it was a lot of pixels. And um, yeah, we, we wanted to have like the fish to swim like an organic way. So we tried schooling. This is uh, some kind of algorithm uh, where every fish is looking to the other fish to see if they should uh, swim away or get closer. Um, but this became very heavy. We did some tests with uh, super intelligent uh, Darren Britter. And, uh, but yeah, eventually yeah, it didn't work out for the whole room because it's, yeah, it was too heavy. So uh, what we did is creating noise fields and calculating curl noise out of it. So you get like a little bit of a spiral effect. And then all the fish were looking to the environment, how they need to swim. And then we could have like 100,000 fish instead of like 1,000. Yeah, so basically like a big water bowl where we stir in it and all the fish just drift away with the swims. <clears throat> um, this was, and this is also the reason why we, we call this talk Research Driven, because um, uh, this whole field is exploding. Uh, of course, in the art world and stuff, there's a lot of immersive experience and stuff. Uh, but, but now, after the pandemic, um, there were a couple of cases where like big like, team lab and, and moment factory, they set up immersive spaces and suddenly the people realized you can make money with it. So there's a lot of things happening, like things popping up, uh, which brings the technology to people without technology background. Um, so there's a lot of uh, art directors and stuff, and they, they want to do something with this, but they have no experience with it. So what do they do? They go on Instagram and look for stuff that's already been done and say, like, I want that. So in our case, we, like, we made this fish thing, and uh, yeah, everybody came to us like, we want, also, we want more fish. <laughs> <laughs> so we did now, uh, we, we're rebranding our company, the fish company. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, no, no, we, we're now fed up with the fish, but we did, uh, we're now in the fifth, of, yeah, fifth, fifth, yeah. Right? fifth, fifth, fifth. Yeah. Um, so it's really important to, to, to put out there what you want to do, because everything you do attracts new client work. Uh, so that's why we're really pushing forward to uh, make stuff on our own and, and putting it out there. Um, one thing where, where it comes together is our Irish framework, like our background is in the big raves and dance parties. Um, and we figure out you have two ways of to make new things. Uh, uh, one is like to be an artist and, and really dive into something and go deeper and deeper. And at one point you find your own style, you find your own thing. And the other approach is to remix stuff, to grab something from here and grab something from here, tie it together and make something new. In the dance world, uh, because it's running on all uh, old protocols, you have all these different islands, and we created a framework where we can connect all those things. So as an example, um, a simple example where we have like video running on the thing, we use the, the position, we put the whole venue in, into one 3D environment, we grab all the data from it, and then we can send it to other stuff. So in this case, we send the video to the light, or a bit more complex, so you can create like light shows. But if you take it one step further, we also have all the positions of the lights. Uh, we know where they're aiming at, so we can calculate, okay, when does it hit like the screen? So you can generate content based on that screen. Uh, now, we're super enthusiastic about this. We're doing it with moving ads, but moving ads are quite complex uh, uh, motors and engines and stuff, and it's really hard to get this synced. Yeah, they were, they were a bit slow, like, like if, if you start turning around, then they, uh, they have a little bit delay, so it was very hard to get it really, did. this is a preface, so it looks perfectly, but in real life it's whoop. Yeah, because you like, missed that fact. Yeah. With lasers on the other hand. Yeah. Oh, this. Yeah, 
so with lasers, it's, it's way easier because where you point, you immediately get the beam. So we could like um, interact any uh, patch and, and yeah, connect it to, to the laser. Instantly, yeah. So we did a small ca calibration system for it. And, uh, but, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one thing of the whole Iris framework is that we wanted to have a previs that we were working with the actual data, so you could hook up the lights and, the, and they work, but also have the same feeling when you're, what you're doing in touch, that you, you do it instantly. You don't have to think, you don't get pulled out of the creative process, you can just make stuff and, um, uh, and, and looks, yeah, check how it looks. And most importantly, to have something to show to clients or to our directors or to other people, um, that are not so into the, the technical part. So a couple of uh, things. Now we're updating it with smoke. Uh, you can't really see it. No, no. But it's getting uh, it's getting more and more realistic. Now Max is also he, he made a, like a model so we can make the the crowd animate and dance. Yeah, the crowd right now looks a little bit boring. Yeah, <laughs> boring party. <laughs> well. Uh, another example, yeah. So this one, um, we needed content to show for the Iris platform to, to okay, what does it do? We, like this comes from the presentation for Iris. Uh, so we made this hat, we, we rigged it, and uh, we have one position which we send to the content, so they always looks at it, and to the lights, so it follows the lights. Uh, when we showed it to several people, then uh, uh, at the same time we were busy with our own uh, place. Uh, we showed it to the creative director, and he's like, yeah, I, I want that. So then we got the space to actually develop it and put it into real uh, world. So here we used uh, uh, blob tracking with the infrared cameras on top, and uh, now I, I'm the actor. <laughs> yeah. And um, uh, so when you walk, uh, the hat will point towards you which looks like it, it really looks to, towards you, but for me, the perspective where I'm walking, of course it doesn't because it's a flat screen. But this uh, gave us the opportunity to really have the space and develop uh, more things that, uh, yeah, that turned into a maze. A little video. So this whole uh, <laughs> thanks. So this whole project was a, a weird one. Like basically, we had like a, this was a research project on our own. Um, uh, the pandemic hit. We uh, our studio was above a club of 2,500 people, uh, but of course there couldn't be any parties. Uh, so with a really small team, we had the idea. Okay, let's start using the main room as a immersive spot. And then it became like two rooms and three rooms and, uh, and at one point it was nine rooms. Um, mm -hmm. But all thinking on the spot and making it, like they wanted to have open up in April and they started constructing it in January, so we had three months. Uh, so we had um, uh, a really nice team. Uh, Darian was there and Shandor came over from Paris and then Nick Sart and Peter, Peter and David. Yeah, but it was all like really, okay, we have a problem that how can we fix it together? Uh, normally in the commercial things, you, you, everything is like written down. This was on the go, which was amazing, but also really stressful at the time. Yeah, so one of the rooms, so the entrance room, the first room was a, a tunnel. It had uh, seven hexagons, uh, real life hexagons with uh, LED strips on top of it. 
And then uh, on the back, we had a LED screen. And what we did is uh, extend, the LED, or extend the hexagons into the LED screen. So we made uh, 32 uh, hexagons. And the first one, first seven were the real ones, and the 25 after uh, was a digital one. So in the, in the bottom, you see a previs. And on the right, um, there is a, the final output of the LED screen. And Shando made uh, the content for this. Thank you, Sander. Uh, this was a really good learning thing for us. Uh, we had like one room with 207 or 8. Six. Uh, 206. Sander, that's, yeah, <laughs> 206 uh, spots. And you could control it uh, in the middle uh, with, uh, with a lead motion. Um, and uh, we thought it was amazing. We, we, we did all the um, uh, previous stuff from the top. Uh, but then when you're standing there, you, yeah, it, it was a different uh, look. But mostly what we discovered is that people without a technology background, they don't know how to use it. Like, yeah, they don't understand, uh, at least like in the first, first idea when you see uh, such a thing that you can move your hand around, yeah, then it's, it's not very common. Like, like swiping or something on an iPhone, it's very common, everybody understands this, but like moving your hand up and down, that's... People were smashing it and moving it under the table and then... And then if you don't have that first instant click that you feel the, you're talking to an installation, you lose it. And then with people like, yeah, okay, I don't get it. I'll go away. Or they're scared. And now it's a touch screen and now it's super easy and everybody just, yeah. Everybody understands yeah. it. This is an example. I mean, creatively, it's not the most creative uh, thing, but it, it works instantly because everybody knows if there's a swing, you sit on it and you start swinging. Now we have the third actor. This is Rogier. <laughs> <laughs> so we develop a, a small framework to make, uh, easily make um, uh, Kinect installations uh, together with Eves. And there are three different installations here, one by Josef, and Darian, and uh, Nick Sutt made one. Yeah, the, the, the main room. So this was actually, we, we did the whole Iris platform. Now we had a chance to yeah, uh, have the space to work. It's, we had 65 pillars and um, uh, 3D audio. Dave and Gabe from New York, they made a whole system that we can have like multi sound set up. There were 15 different uh, things, the, uh, speakers. And uh, so, technology wise, this was really advanced and really works really well. Problem, however, like people come in and, and people are still like, uh, in an art installation, this would work great because you go into an art installation and you think like, okay, what, what should I do? Uh, when you don't have that background, you think of it as big TVs and, the, and still the thing is like you sit in front of the TV and the TV spits all this information on top of you and you're, uh, you, you want to be entertained. So we had one scene where we, we thought it would be nice to have like graphics on one side, there's also a screen on this side. Uh, have content on that side and then uh, halfway this through the show, turn it around. But people went in and they start looking at the screen and then we turn it black because all the show is happening behind them. But they didn't turn around. Like they just <laughs> kept on staring at the black screen. Yeah. Now it's turned into a beanbag sitting show. With a, yeah. But we're in the process of updating it. Uh, here's an example uh, when we were working on it and, and doing some tests. Uh, here we used, every pilot had a different UV map, and then we uh, uh, created a particle system that goes around uh, the pilots and added some uh, fluid dynamics to make it more organic. And then uh, we put some nice effects like exploding uh, feelings, but it was just testing. It was our office. Yeah, we had like a law that you couldn't uh, leave your house uh, in the pandemic. But we had like a note that we could work. So this was our uh, evening, uh, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if we, yeah, there you can see. We had a nice little plant there and the couch. And I think that's there we in in the back. Uh, yeah, so because it was so intense, uh, it was amazing that we could do this. There was also no other time that we could do this because they. The, the budget was really slow, uh, really uh, low in the beginning, and it kept adding up. The idea was that it was only open for the pandemic time, 
but now there's like a, yeah, it's, it's booked out, uh, and they, they just uh, switched the permit, so now it's like a permit for the next seven years, this will be there, and we keep like uh, updating it and uh, working on it. Um, yeah, so the, 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 the thing, the, can you go one slide back? That hat that we made, basically for Iris, which we did uh, on our own, that turned into be one of the key visuals of this whole event. Um, and this also, like, if you do that kind of stuff, uh, what you make, uh, people approach you uh, to make some more of it. So we really wanted to take back control and first make stuff and then uh, put it out there, then get the time and the money to develop it into an actual product. Yeah, so the question is, what do we want to make? And uh, yeah, one thing what, that, that we really like is to make our, our, our work uh, feel organic, feel like, like that it uh, could exist in nature, in a sense. Um, so one part of it is, is trying to understand nature, how, how does it work? And uh, a big research of, uh, of us is um, relearning physics, like everybody, uh, I guess, had, had physics at high school, but immediately forgot after. Same like me. So uh, now relearning it and uh, trying to apply it with, with a little test. Like for example here we use uh, collision forces, Newtonian physics, and um, uh, spring forces. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's quite uh, interesting if you get the uh, equations right, if you have the model of, of the physical um, behavior uh, and, and you implement it, it suddenly feels very organic without you faking anything. So for example, uh, in, the, in this case, uh, we use uh, something called conservation of momentum, where um, heavy objects um, collide with a bigger force than uh, smaller objects. Like for example, this red ball feels very heavy. So when it falls down, the, the, the white ball should explode to the, to the right. And this automatically happens if you apply the, the right equation. And it's very hard to fake. Like if you, if you put like a, a, a noise field or something and, and throw them away, you always feel uncomfortable because in, in a sense, we all know what nature does uh, subconsciously. So if it's wrong, you immediately know it. You feel it that it's wrong. And after that, you can do some artistic deviations, like, for example, here, uh, we added some attractor, like here, and then automatically it still feels uh, organic, because, yeah, the laws of physics still apply. Yeah, we, we don't use flex, uh, I think, like, flex is basically is doing that, the only problem is it's a framework, so you're stuck to what Flex wants you to know. Plus, like, if you really want to master Flex, you have to know the, the nature as well, because there's so many parameters uh, that it's, it's quite a challenge to get it. Uh, to get yeah, it. For, for example, this, is, this thing could be done in Flex, yeah. but like uh, the past one, this one, is going to be tricky, but it has the same kind of uh, physics behind it. So we also tested it out in a maze with a laser. Now, and those uh, lines that we draw by the laser, and uh, those use those spring forces. And, and this is also a good example that, like now suddenly you connect the room to the content, it's no longer video, it's like it becomes one, one thing, because you have this beam going uh, on top of your head, and it becomes one. So those uh, spring forces, it is like, uh, like this guy on the right, uh, we, we uh, connect a Kinect to it, and it, uh, it comes down like if you, if you pull, uh, or if there's a force on a piece of rope, it will get pulled back. So for example here, if I pull it, it will bounce back and oscillate. And if you have many of those segments uh, connected to each other, you get those hairy, uh, hairy things. Now what you also can do is put them next to each other, like, like this, and uh, yeah, then you get like many hairs. It, it also bounces like that. They are separately bouncing. But if you, that's a funny thing. If you connect them, like having another spring um, 
yeah, next to them, connecting the neighboring springs together, and suddenly uh, waves appear. You get this wave kind of behavior. Feels very organic. In my, uh. So if you then add another dimension, then you get a surface, and it gets like this very uh, organic feeling of, of yeah, kind of watery like uh, feeling. So this texture we're using here now, it feels more like cloth and it doesn't fit. So it's better to do a different rendering and have it having more like water. This is done by uh, ray marching. So it's a big hobby of mine. <laughs> yeah. So uh, applying this, the, the, this idea of waves, or at least like this organic feeling of waves, uh, this is a, a bit of a different technique, but we use sine waves and different frequencies to modulate and get this, yeah, this automatically this organic feeling. Also done with ray marching, uh, which we're not going to describe in depth. But if you're curious, I did a workshop in TDSW last year, um, which is available here. So write it quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's the touch designer study group in Japan. Yeah, the Tokyo. Yeah, and he, he really explains it well. So if you want to get into ray marching, then uh, check it out. Um, one way that we're also applying all this, uh, not so technical, but, but getting the organic feel into stuff, like we wanted to make uh, paintings as if, like get the digital stuff, like get the digital layer off and make it feel like uh, more emotional and more warm, basically. And instead of the squares, use the round form. Uh, paint is something that, uh, yeah, you, you have that feeling instantly. Uh, so we did, yeah, it, it keeps coming back to, okay, how can we simulate this? This is done already uh, uh, some time ago using just displacement um, on a 3D model. Then we took it one step further to analyze, get an incoming uh, picture, analyze like the, the colors and try to bend them, uh, get like paint strokes. This was all on a random uh, street view uh, um, things to generate it from uh, uh, random street view photos. Uh, but the problem with this is that if you have like this, this displacement layer on top, if you start animating it, the displacement doesn't uh, move with it. So, so yeah, it, it, uh, you lose the feel of the realism. It's, um, uh, it becomes like instantly a computer effect. The other technique is with the uh, analyzing of the, the brush strokes, but that becomes more like this old school video clip, like frame by frame painting, and, and still like not really nice, we thought. So we start diving into, okay, how can you animate it? How can you make like the animation itself also feel fluidy and, and, and nice? Uh, first using feedback, uh, it's nice for water calling and stuff, but yeah, still uh, an effect then start applying uh, um, fluid uh, sims to it, not via Stokes. Uh, but this is morally for uh, um, smoky effects and also not really uh, paint the effect. And then, well. Yeah, then uh, we found an, uh, an article from uh, Michael Morris about uh, a technique which he called uh, reintegration tracking. And um, well, also, I won't go into depth uh, how it works, but you can look it up. He, he explained this very well. And this gives a uh, way more like a watery effect, uh, less smoky. Yeah. So you can really design like how it's flowing with, with noise, basically. Uh, then we added some extra steps on top of it. And then uh, this, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the aim of this thing, like to create things like fire, basically. Fire is something which is uh, super simple to understand. You look at a flame and you think like, okay, it's a flame, you see the, the form, but still it has this magical thing that you can keep looking at it. You always see different stuff. It's like uh, really uh, hypnotizing. So we want to make like stuff that can run forever, uh, which is really easy to understand. And this uh, thing as well, like you, you see a running man, uh, but but the, you can always see different details in it. Um, 
we're not there yet, but it, but it's it's getting there. It's, uh, we're quite happy with where yeah, how it's going and all the details. So then, like one part is like the research for getting that feeling and stuff, but then you have to apply it. Like you have to control it. And then, uh, how many of you uh, people saw our last talk in Montreal? Okay, only a couple. Oh no. Huh? A bit more. I'm back. Well, um, do we have some time? Yeah, we have some time. Two minutes. Okay, really quickly. Um, yeah, 28 minutes. We're, so we're, we're good. We're good. Um, yeah, this one then. So the, um, when you start designing, you um, uh, with Photoshop, uh, you, you yourself put a line down and you put another line down, another line down, and suddenly you have something evolving. What we started doing is like a parametric approach. Uh, instead of putting everything uh, down, we use uh, parameters and use the options, like what can come out of it, uh, to generate stuff. In this case, like it's a pure simple um, uh, grid division of uh, uh, a square. It's being divided on a, in an aspect ratio, and then uh, divided again, divided again, divided again, and then add some colors and stuff like that. So you can end up with a lot of different variations. Which is nice, but it's stills. And it's like, it's a certain you pick which seeds you want uh, for a creative expression. It's nice, it, it, you turn up with really a lot of different uh, outcomes that you didn't expect. But still, you have to pick the seed. Um, and that, uh, how can we make something that always comes out differently? Like, uh, uh, then you can work with presets, but, but still you're fixed in this thing. <coughs> so what we want to make, like what, what we really want to do is like, again, the fire effect, but then with something that you just start with a, a simple algorithm and it just evolves. So here uh, we used um, um, Seller Automata uh, from a workshop from uh, Darren Brito again. Also TVSW. Yeah. Also, it's online, so you can check it out. And then we found uh, uh, clusters by Jeffrey Ventrula, and that was uh, really inspiring. Like uh, basically, super simple concept. You have a particle groups, and you just tell them like uh, this one group likes this group, so he gets attracted, uh, or this group hates that group, so he goes away. So if you make that in a in a, a matrix and say like okay. Uh, uh, you like that one, but this one is angry at you. So you get this whole play of, of, uh, uh, of particles being... Uh, yeah, and then you can just randomize those values in the matrix, you see there, and then suddenly they behave completely different. Super nice, yeah. So then we started doing some more research for the look. Added some normals to get it more depth, and adding, uh, again, uh, Navier-Stokes fluid dynamics. You get a more fluidy feeling. And, and this was really, this took so long to make. Yeah. And not because it's so complex, uh, but because every time you do a different seed, and then suddenly you see this guy and you start following. So every time like we were programming, and then you get distracted for half an hour looking at what this guy is going to do. Yeah, um, That's the last one. yeah. so we want to conclude this talk with um, we have this uh, framework where we uh, build everything in, and we have the small button to record like 10 seconds animation clip uh, to send to each other or uh, uh, to Rogier or to, uh, to just show our progress. Um, so this, we're still building with it. We have no purpose for it yet. It's an uh, installation or... Uh, uh, but we made, we hooked it up to Ableton, uh, that directory where we have like uh, 200 clips. And um, just uh, randomize uh, the play yeah. playback of the clips. Yeah. So here it goes. Intro. <laughs> Music by Max Cooper. Yeah, Max Cooper.
Do you do encores? <laughs> okay, that was, uh, yeah. whew. okay, I, I guess no questions. <laughs> Okay, you want to go first, eh? Yeah, yeah, sure, with stupid one. Did you make it with stage designer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Have a nice that one. This is a random. I turn the work, the rest is I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the one with the head uh, and with the uh, with the beams. Yeah, mm. that's all touch. Uh, that's all touch, yeah. 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 So is, is some rain marching also? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, to 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 uh, render out uh, the light in the yeah the light beams and the, the screen uh, with the head yeah 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 mm. yeah this one yeah this one. yeah, mm. yeah. Cool. it's all touch let's see I think the okay. preface is here. Mm. Yeah, this is the yeah this is the the real thing but more serious uh, I'm curious about this iris framework. Uh, in general, what is what is it exactly? It's just like a, in what form does it exist in the form of like touch design a project, or it's like a library of some? Yeah. So when we when we started, we really wanted to make a product. Like we we, we did a lot of rave stuff, and if you have uh, uh, the big events are being controlled from the front of the house, which is basically a big table with all the people controlling light and laser. And, uh, and video, and it's all uh, like a team on the side. But um, uh, the party is like, it needs to be balanced. Like if you start smashing the lights all the time, like the laser guy doesn't see anything anymore. So they have to keep space for each other, like an orchestra basically. If they all start playing the music at the same time, you get like a mess. So we, we thought like, okay, we have this thing where we can put it in the middle and can help um, uh, that front of house because it's really hard to you need a good team to create a good show. But then we finished that, and, and there's quite a lot of interest in it and stuff. But then we thought, like, yeah, we don't want to be a software company. So we, we use it for our own projects, uh, but we don't um, um, uh, give it out in, in, uh, uh, as, a, as a standalone thing. Because then you have to write the manuals, and uh, yeah, we want to create the content with it. So yeah. Yeah, so <clears throat> so basically, uh, completely in in touch. Um, so the the environment is in touch, and we can just drag in uh, content modules, like uh, build like little components, and then uh, run it in the preface. Yeah, which is fun to create the shows. Okay, that's right now. But, but you could release the open source, right? And then... <laughs> uh, if, if there's a specific thing you want to know, then we're happy to share all the stuff that we're doing. But even like releasing something, uh, there's a lot of people out there that uh, it takes a lot of energy and a lot of things. So, so we, we, we definitely are open to share everything, but more on a one-to-one -one basis than... Uh, them releasing it was you know we're quite busy with other stuff and it's and if you're releasing it, it has to be perfect as well and it's a, yeah it's a lot of time okay but, cool. but you know, I'll, I'll message you <laughs> <laughs> more than welcome uh, first of all great work really I love your stuff and um, yeah I've been actually to the remastered not so long ago uh, pretty nice uh, all the exhibition is top notch and. Uh, yeah, I just thought that it was like compared to like your work in the maze, for example, it was a bit more maybe commercial. And uh, I wanted to know maybe a bit the difference between the kind of challenges and ideas that you had working on a bit more maybe personal project and something you had a bit more uh, creative uh, um, yeah, possibilities uh, like for a maze and uh, the other project for remastered, like where were the main differences and similarities actually between these two projects? Yeah, so by, by remastered, uh, we, we really get like a, a project, um, uh, yeah, project brief. Like the, 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 um, uh, the guys really want to have fish. They want really, <laughs> really want to have like this fish room and fish swimming around and very blue. Because that, that we didn't really like it that it was that blue. No, no, not much color, really bluish. And uh, yeah, with, with, with a maze. Yeah, I just so so that was more more like a technical uh, thing because yeah, everything had to run like really fast. Really wanted to the the instant uh, interaction with it um, with remastered, with remastered, yeah. 
with um, uh, a remarks are quite simple because you, you touch it and you see something happening. So the whole interactive part was easy. With a maze, um, it's not as easy because you cannot touch the LED screens because then they have to buy new LED screens every week. So the, 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 the challenges in getting the interactive part in there is, is totally different. And in the end, like now as well, in a maze, there's just videos running. Like, uh, step by step, we have to do it. And yeah, I mean, the difference in style and stuff, yeah, that's just taste. Uh, and that's why I also really like touch and this stuff, because like, like what Tim was showing with the, with the spring force, you have one simple core idea and you can apply it to a lot of different stuff. So it doesn't really matter if you put fish in there or like gigantic <coughs> robots that kill you when you touch it or something, or, <laughs> yeah. But we, we do work from the technical thing first and the looks and, and then the concepts. So and now we start to work more closely with concept guys and stuff to put more meaning in it. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Really impressive but also intimidating for the beginners, honestly. <laughs> so I was wondering, could, could you maybe talk a little bit about the beginning of your creative journey and maybe just kind of give an example of the first project was, which was kind of like commercial and successful and like maybe like not in terms of money, of course, but in terms of the, the task and the, the challenge that you were able to achieve within this project so that what was the first thing that made you stable and get going? Well, actually the first thing that made us stable and get going was the talk in Montreal. Because we were, okay, we, we had a motion graphic company and, and suddenly like this whole programming stuff came along. I can show my first project. You can? Yeah, it's in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, 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 not to rush you because we all want to see it, but the next talk is in 12 minutes, so okay. maybe okay. two minutes. So I made a button. That was my first project. <laughs> I, spent, I spent so long on the interactive part. Uh, mm -hmm. And then, uh, like, there's a path in every touch designer user. If you're coming from the visual side, you start making the patches, and then you think, like, yeah, I want to uh, perform with it. So you start building your own VGA tool. And then when you finish your VGA tool, you think, like, oh, it doesn't run fast enough, so you start getting into the optimization. And, uh, mm -hmm. and slowly, step by step, you, you go there. Like with commercial things, I don't know what our first commercial thing was. No, no. Like the, maybe the Coca-Cola thing? Yeah, that was one of it, I think. Yeah, and, and also, uh, my background is programming, and uh, my brother's Roy uh, background is uh, design, and that, that really fitted together, because I think um, doing both is quite hard. If you're a programmer mind, it's very hard to design. If you're a designer, it's very hard to program. And yeah, that, that really fitted. Yeah. But it's all relative. If you start somewhere, like it's not about like the biggest projects, like uh, uh, learning the new step. And that gives so much motivation that you want to keep on going and keep on going. And I'm sure that, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're not even done exploring yeah. everything it's just the beginning and that that makes this whole thing so exciting because there are no rules yet like we yeah we can build our own things yeah. super cool <laughs> <laughs> okay I just want to mention quickly that uh, <clears throat> if you've seen any of the posts that we've made leading up to this event that <coughs> these guys are responsible for uh, designing this application that um, you know basically generates uh, uh, video after video, um, you got your text stats, you put your information in, you got your images, and it really, really, really simplifies uh, promoting an event or uh, just making videos. So thank you very much for uh, for helping us with that. Uh, no, one last thing. Um, we organize also an, uh, a meetup the 9th of May in, uh, where is it? Amaze. Yeah, <laughs> in this room. <laughs> so we can we can play around with the with the pilots and stuff. Yeah, you can plug your computer into uh, a pillar and uh, 
So come. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks. That was Thank you. amazing. <laughs>
Hello. Oh, there. Everybody, let's start again. Okay, well, um, I guess you already uh, saw Vilan sitting here on the side. Uh, thanks again, Vilan, for also uh, being part of the whole organizational team here for the event. Dankeschön. <laughs> so in parts, I guess you don't need a real introduction since, but... Um, uh, what did we write? Well, anybody looking for production-ready tools that help immensely while delivering touch designer-based projects will have come across OLIP, VLAN's labor of love and important free resource of touch designer comp components to the U uh, community. Uh, you're going to show a URL, maybe? Um, I, I can show it. Yeah, yeah perfect. Good. Uh, today, VLAN, a Berlin-based creative developer, will lift the curtain to reveal what's necessary to create and run interactive and immersive installations. We'll hear about VLAN's approach of system design from the perspective of a stage technician, highlighting technical aspects in planning, production, and deployment of projects. So there we go. Yeah, danke schön. <laughs> Okay, so uh, first I just put this um, meme uh, in here because with the Garrettsons it's always like, okay, yeah, we, we put like a little bit of stuff in there and then it uh, suddenly looks good. So yeah, draw the rest of the hole. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I look behind and I have a typo already. I'm sorry for that. I look behind the curtain. I look at system architecture. Um, maybe um, Marcus already told a little bit and gave a teaser. And I think it might be important to understand where I am coming uh, from. So some stuff about me. I'm uh, Berlin-based. I was uh, born in Potsdam, just around the corner, and e effectively living in Berlin for, uh, yeah, I think it's already eight years now. And I'm not a designer, which you should clearly see by this presentation, because it has no belts and whistles. It's really just like bare to the bone. And I'm a trained stage technician. So this means I uh, worked for over six, uh, <coughs> six years in the Opera, uh, Deutsche Oper Berlin, here in Berlin, which is the biggest opera house in, uh, in Berlin, with uh, almost 2,000 seats, um, and made my apprenticeship there, and then worked like most of the time as uh, the head video technician for three and a half years there, um, using all kinds of video equipment, uh, projectors, but also creating new systems from uh, for the stage design, uh, for new stage designs coming from stage designers, um, creating projections, but also operating everything uh, using lighting desks and media server software. So not even specifically touch designer stuff, but my experience in this field helps me tremendously in uh, working with touch design and especially working on larger scale projects. I'm uh, employed here at Monomango GmbH. So upstairs is my uh, office, but I'm also freelancing um, based at the Node Institute in uh, Wipperstraße here in Neukölln, also in Berlin, um, sharing a space together with Stefan and Mickey and uh, yeah, so I think, um, if I count, I think I've made projects with around seven people here in the room. Uh, lately, a nice project also with Dan, Function Store over there. So um, even if this one isn't uh, not enough for you, you can at least take the word of this random uh, person from Reddit who says, uh, the Python package manager TDPIP, which I wrote, is how to do third-party Python packages, yada, yada, yada. Seriously, if you find components or tutorials about Alpha Moon base, pay attention. They know what they're doing. So I hope this one uh, improves your confidence in what I'm talking about now. System architecture and system design. It's a very, very boring topic for many people, especially because uh, there's not a lot you can share on Instagram or anything about that. But it's um, a very important part um, because everyone sooner or later comes about this hurdle. Um, how can I make a project that is deployable uh, reliable and, um, in best case, reusable in some way. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about this. Um, <clears throat> and there are many angles to consider. There are, of course, um, financial. The art design, of course, is also a huge important part of uh, how to set up a design. But also the team size, type, and location. Because a one-off one show on a trade fair is something completely different than a permanent installation that's going to run for one year. And <clears throat> There are two elements uh, to keep in mind, hardware and software. I'm not going to talk too much about hardware. I'm just going to give you some bullet points because, to be honest, uh, hardware is super, super dependent on um, the project location, but also your experience. Um, having experience and knowing how a system works, how certain key components, how hardware components work, um, and how reliable they are and what the shortcomings are is um, something you just have to experience yourself because people will tell you, no, don't do this and don't use this. But quite often, if uh, you don't have experienced failure of a cheap component for yourself, um, you just don't want to listen because it's cheap compared to like spending 10 times the amount. Quadro versus GeForce card, for example. I, I just had a project like this, on, not just had, it's like two years ago, where basically I was telling the client, please buy Quadro cards, uh, and they didn't. And we were working with LED walls, and uh, suddenly on deployment day, we had screen tearing. And I just said, I told you so. And this is a nice feeling to be able to tell I told you so. But also, it's a, a shitty feeling, because then you have to fix it in some way. So yeah, um, in general, trying to make as much from one source is I don't know, I should probably delete this uh, bullet point because it's more in, uh, in regard to software. But in general, um, feathering everything out too much can be uh, quite a backbreaker because the more moving parts you have in a project and in a system, the more can go wrong. Uh, also, don't try to force something into a role it was not designed for, especially if we are talking about um, uh, consumer hardware versus professional hardware, especially <clears throat> stuff like microphones, uh, transmitters, like they're like this cheap HDMI Wi-Fi transmitters that you can get on Amazon for, I don't know, like 30 bucks. And then you look at some um, Bolt transmitters for like two to 6,000 euro, but there's a key difference in, uh, so be sure. And, uh, but in the first place, don't use wireless transmission at all. If you can, mitigate it. Cables is the truth. Like, co copper is uh, gold. <laughs> so there are um, four topics or like keywords that are more or less intertwined with one another. So um, there might be like some bleeding between the different topics. Um, and then we have the inter-process communication. I w just wanted to put it in here, but it's not a super big part of everything, but still there's uh, some words I have about this. <clears throat> we have a statelessness, composition, reusability, and repeatability. It's like the four main topics. And the first thing is uh, statelessness, and this is something which is quite important, but also comes back as like the bare bone of a lot of the other systems is that a project like a tow file ideally should not contain any state. So like no information should be part of the tow file. We should try to, to bring every information, every configuration, every setting somewhere outside of our tow file. Because otherwise we come in a situation where like, okay, we're saving something and we had just trying something around and then we're saving it and committing it and suddenly on deployment day we just realized, fuck, somewhere in this project I put some information and now I have to dive super deep to get any information or like be able to change it and I just cannot remember anymore where it is. So having your information externally makes your life a lot easier. So what is a good idea is of uh, thinking of your project not as a project stand alone, but more as an application that is loading a project. Because if you think about stuff like um, <clears throat> Ableton or uh, Premiere or After Effects, or like any software that we use productively, we're in the situation it's like, okay, we're not having one uh, installation of, uh, 
of After Effects for every project, but instead we're we are loading projects. So we're saving the information externally from our program. And I think for this, is an, it's um, at least an idea <coughs> for me. I'm so sorry, May. So instead of understanding Touch Designer as a software for interactive media, it's a framework. So I'm using Touch Designer to build software for, for the specific use cases. <clears throat> so, and uh, there are several ways how we can do this and using the external information. We can use config files, we can uh, use environment variables, or we can even go further and say, okay, we're doing everything over a web server and using REST APIs or something similar. And I have something open here already. And uh, one thing that I have here is, I just prepared this, um, is my prefab project that I basically use for everything, more or less. And inside of here, we already have the configs. And has anyone ever used, except the ones I worked with, um, the JSON config component? <clears throat> no one, okay. So basically what the JSON config component is doing is it's uh, saving a lot of information into a JSON file that lies on, um, on our hard drive or SSD. And what we can then do is we can use edit um, to simply uh, have a reusable uh, component that we can change. And what's quite interesting about this one <clears throat> is that what I like to do is like I like to define a default state for this, but then the uh, JSON file will live not inside of our repository, so not as part of our project, but it will live in uh, the documents folder, for example, or in app data. <clears throat> And the next thing what we can do with this specific component is we can load different files dependent on uh, an environment variable that we have set before. So what this means is that depending on, um, on how we set this environment variable, we can load different values. Um, and so this way we can be very flexible. We can have a JSON file for computer one, computer B, or for <clears throat> um, I just have one screen, or I have two screens, I have three screens, like this. And the way you define these uh, JSON config is uh, probably a little bit intimidating. But uh, you do it by callback. So you can just define uh, a new object but why do we do that? Um, this is quite a cool new feature. I'm going to release it soon. Is we can now do binding. So what I can do here is I can uh, bind a parameter to this configuration. Now what I, I can just go in here, <coughs> save something, and now in here I can save this configuration. Now if we go to edit, you can see that we saved it to the JSON file. So this, of course, makes it quite easy to be able to, okay, we have the JSON file that we can take uh, to modify our project, but also we can uh, easily work with parameters as we are used to. Another example that I'm not going to too deep into because this will also be part of uh, my workshop for the summer season of the Node Institute. So if you haven't checked that out, take a look there, is uh, using a web client and just using a REST API because it's also, again, just JSON. So we can use this to um, also configure our, uh, our project. For example, with uh, headless CMS systems like Directus, uh, Payload CMS, Strapi. Uh, I haven't used Payload, but it looks very programmy, less user-friendly, but uh, more transportable. The next part, um, which I'm, no, I haven't really uh, scratched that, is composition. <clears throat> and this is another approach that I like to do with uh, projects nowadays, is that instead of creating, as I said, because we're, we are not loading, uh, we are loading a project into our software, well, we can even give, make this one step further and we can compose our software based on an external configuration. So we can even go one step further. And 
Yeah, I'm allowed to show this because um, we're going to go a little bit into how the table over there is actually um, using this exact composition part. Boop, 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 boop. So you can see already it looks quite similar to the other project that I already had open, um, mainly because I have a prefab and I'm also going to share the prefab with you. Um, and what you can see here is there isn't really much going on in the sense of interactive systems or something. We have a renderer, we have an output, and we have a system. So um, in system, this means there are just components for this OS framework, as we call it. So here's some important information. So for example, we're using MQTT for inter-process communication. We have some design information, <coughs> some general information. <coughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's uh, good stuff. Um, <clears throat> we have our uh, multi-touch framework that we're using, but I'm going back into the whole framework building, um, and some very generic information just about the, the viewport that we are going to use for rendering, because um, if you go a little bit more into the uh, user interface building, you stumble upon this whole PX value that gets uh, used quite a lot in web development. And if you dig a little bit deeper, you just realize that not, it's, it's not pixels, because a PX is um, actually like a viewing distance and a <clears throat> monitor size uh, dependent value. So I'm doing a lot of calculations for this here too. As you can see, again, I'm using uh, this external configuration, because this means on every computer that we are deploying this OS on, I can easily um, just change the values without having to change anything in my actual repository where this information is in. <coughs> oh. um, and then we have this plugins folder here. Let's look into this. And here we have some, some logic. And uh, what then happens in here, if we go into mount, see we have uh, system plugins, we have applets, overlays, and exclusive. <clears throat> and this is more or less something that doesn't have super high importance. But uh, because the multi-touch framework we are using is uh, working completely in 3D space, we uh, can easily this way decide which elements come on top. So we have exclusive content like the lock screen you're seeing right there that is just laying over everything else. And then we have overlays that are consistent. We have applets and we have systems without even an UI. <clears throat> and the way this works, if we go into system now, we, uh, for example, here have an audio player component that <clears throat> is just required to play audio content. So like system sounds, stuff like this. and. The way it works is uh, in our project, we have the uh, plugins folder. And in this plugins folder, I just put subfolders, and in here is a manifest and the talks file. And on startup, I'm loading these plugins. But this just sounds like a tow file with extra steps, right? The good thing is, I put this plugins folder into the git ignore. Well, why would I do that? Because now I can put a new repository from git in there. This means I can, depending on the use case that we have, just compose different plugins, just drop them into a repository, clone this repository, and have a completely different system. So I don't have to take care of updating the OS for every project that we have running, but instead <clears throat> I have them completely separated. So I have one project that is taking care of the overarching, where I have like the multi-touch framework and like the MQTT stuff and the inter-process communication, and the specific use cases and functionality is completely defined by these plugins. Whew. Uh. So, and also this helps quite a lot. Um, because we are uh, because we are constructing basically the project every time <coughs> based on uh, external information, <coughs> we adhere to this statelessness. 
So because every time we are, we are destroying uh, the world and rebuilding it, we can specifically rely on the fact that uh, we have a clean slate. So there's this uh, quote. I suppose maybe a very important person once said it, but I have it in my mind because it was written on a wall or a pole next to my school when I was uh, 18. Uh, you don't need to change the world. It is enough to reconstruct it. Because trying to to create a clean startup state for a project that already has a specific state is tedious and it never, never really fully works from my experience. So just saying, hey, let's do it all from ground zero up is uh, always a good way. It takes a little bit to get used to it, but makes life easier. Uh, next one is reusability. I know this talk right now is super dry, but I do not repeat myself. Oh, wow. But this talk is as dry as my throat. Um, I think dry is relatively clear. It's like a paradigm that we use in programming, just meaning don't repeat yourself. So this is something that I see especially a lot with beginners, is like this concept of like, okay, I drag the, the um, selector over my component, control Z, control V, and just like plunging it there. Um, so instead just try to build and construct it into like submodules, bases, toxes, and instead use, maybe even use cloning. I don't know, how is your stand on uh, cloning? Yeah, it's, okay, so it, I have some positive, some negative. I'm also more on the negative side, but sometimes it works quite well, but you have to be super careful. <laughs> mm, so yeah, constructing the project into functional modules that you can save out and uh, reuse and even go a little bit further and um, build complete uh, more or less frameworks, like I did with the uh, multi-touch framework that we are using. <clears throat> and the cool thing is what can help there a lot is uh, Git submodules. Who has used Git submodules? How's your experience? Not, not very good. Not very good. <laughs> Okay, a lot of head shaking. Uh, we have a similar stand, but we are slowly getting onto the point where it's usable, especially for stuff like this. Because if we look into uh, the table part, um, we also have this folder uh, modules. <clears throat> and what we are also doing is, uh, so we, here we have the multi-touch framework. And again, it's like this, I don't have to go into every separate project and take care of updating uh, a module there, but instead I have a very well-defined API um, and using sub-modules I can make sure that I have a specific version deployed on specific uh, systems. So uh, digging a little bit into sub-modules can help a lot, especially for larger scale and uh, continuous uh, system development. <clears throat> also, uh, locals, so localization, having it in its own repository can help quite a lot. Mm. Yeah, repeatability. Make sure that a project works standalone without user intervention. Because how often have we seen people asking, or how often have we done it ourselves, that it's like, okay, hmm, I have this software, and I have this software, and I have this software, and then I'm user sending, uh, using NDI to, to Resolume, to MatMapper, back to Touch Designer to apply some more filters, and then sending it back, and I have to start everything in a super specific order. Try to uh, not do that, for the first part. But if you have to do something like this, create an automated script that takes care of this. Um, if you know already Python, why not write something in Python that uh, takes care of starting every application, like a watchdog application? I mean, you can even use Touch Designer to take care of starting different applications. Um, and basically, this is uh, just being able to like shut down a computer and shut down a system and restarting it and having it run. And this is something that is key. It's not always easy, but um, you can even go one step further and try to write a self-healing system. 
I just remember one project, Mickey, I think we, you remember, about self-healing systems, uh, where it was more like a cancer in the end. <laughs> no, um, because basically we, um, yeah, it was it was a big bug, but it was, it was on our own because uh, <clears throat> we had several stages that were responsible for starting sub-processes. And this created a situation where a process would be closed for reasons. I, I don't go too deep into it, but the sub-process won't be cloned. So every time the process gets closed and restarted, because we had one watchdog taking care of starting the main project, it would restart the sub-process. So in the end, we had like, 24 sub-processes running. And it took quite a while to understand what was going on. There was also an idea for, uh, for a talk um, called uh, James Bond, no, not James Bond, but um, being the, the victim, the murderer, and the suspect at the same time. <laughs> and another thing that is uh, quite important for understanding this is uh, writing startup uh, routines and procedures, but also uh, init procedures. And for this, I have another component. This is also quite deep, uh, or quite important part of my um, template. It's like this simple init component. Um, it will basically just start on startup, and uh, will emit events for whatever you write in here. So you have a startup event, init sys event, init plugins event, post init event, and then you can just use. Uh, Oh, right, because I'm not cooking, actually. Let's try that again. So we have the event listener here from the OLIP. And then I can just drop this one in here. And now in the callbacks, I can create my callbacks here. And as you can see, now I have functions for these specific steps of my init procedure. And I can be 100% sure that one will be executed after the other. Because how often do we try to find a good way to initialize extensions in the right order? And this uh, helps tremendously with that. Yeah, handle dependencies automatically, basically. Now we, now we are with the uh, inter-process communication, and uh, I mean it, it will be a very short element. Uh, I'm just asking. Uh, so in, in general, inter-process communication is a very broad term. Um, it's when one process needs to communicate with another process. So be it uh, touch designer to touch designer, but also uh, touch designer to projector, or <coughs> uh, touch designer on another computer. What would be a good solution to do that? It is not OSC. <laughs> um, OSC is a very, very nice uh, protocol for continuous data streams, but the main problem is you don't really have like a, a talkback situation. So because it's based on UDP, it's just like spitting out data and not making sure if it comes across, which is totally fine because it's super fast for a continuous data stream like a POTI or positional data or anything like this, but anything where we have to make sure that it actually arrives, you can't rely on it. It works from one computer to another maybe, or even on the same computer, but the moment you have like three or four computers and maybe 12 OD cameras and six uh, LiDAR sensors running around into the, in the same network, and suddenly gets might get a, uh, be a problem. <clears throat> I personally use uh, JSON RPC and MQTT for that. And JSON RPC is a remote procedure call. It's quite similar to um, just like a web request, an HTTP request in a way where for one you can uh, send commands. So you can send messages that don't return any value, which is okay. These are um, messages, but you can also request information. And then you get back an ID, and then uh, when you get a response, you can handle the ID. And I made a little component for that. I think I'm gonna hear this quite often, but not in this one, but in, I uh... know, oh, it's the wrong one. 
also a very good tool. Everyone should use it. It makes your life so much easier. It's the uh, TD Launcher by uh, Enveril Design, Lucas Morgan. <clears throat> you can find it on GitHub. And there, right now, you could already see like this init procedure where it was like, okay, it was starting in um, environment, like in our network editor, but then it went full frame. Then in the beginning, we had a little bit of frame drops, but now it's running all fine, more or less. It's trying to connect to something. But um, maybe just as a quick demo, we can go here. And now if I uh, press load here, we have our uh, timeline. And this, event that I'm sending out <laughs> here. Um, exactly here we have our JSON RCP and it has uh, some functions like um, send request. And what we can do is um, we get, uh, we pass it some information and in the callback uh, we have an on response callback and the on response will pass us uh, for one the result but it will also give us the request that we initially send it and this is completely asynchronous so this way you can send a command uh, or send information or request information <clears throat> the other tool that is uh, quite uh, useful for that is mqtt <laughs> So JSON RCP is like a point-to-point -point connection. Like you, you need one server, and then everyone connects to the server. Um, and if you want to have cross communication, then you have to create like connections to the other ones. And if you have more than two computers, you already have uh, six connections for three computers, and this spirals out of uh, it's unnecessary. Um, MQTT has like this very nice. Um, I, I call it siphon sync uh, <coughs> approach, where basically I'm sending just information to the MQTT broker, and I don't care who gets it. So this is super important for, or like useful for systems that um, might use, um, be very flexible and extendable. Uh, elements for, um, if you have a very generic system that we can scale to several computers or several applications that might talk to another, so for example, being able to create a little touch screen with uh, five buttons. And the computer, like the, the button thingy, doesn't need to know who's actually listening to it. And MQTT is uh, um, extremely useful for that. And I think, yeah, the combination of all of this information is, uh, I just came up with this acronym and I'm loving it. It's uh, Dion Dev. Who has an idea what it means? No one. It's uh, de develop once, deploy everywhere. <laughs> so with all of these um, processes that we just, or I discussed with you, the uh, repeatability and all the other ones, um, we can create our projects in a way where we just have to develop them once and then we can deploy the same project to every computer in our system. And depending on external information that we set and define, they are doing a specific function. And this means we have a lot of uh, reliability because we have redundancy. We can just switch out computers and we don't have to take care of 20 projects, but we have one project that we take care of and then <clears throat> It just works most of the times. And that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. That was not dry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> questions? Um, so you're doing a lot of like uh, message passing, MQT, uh, calling web services. Um, this all takes time, right? You call the thing, you have to wait, uh, you get the response back. Um, so it's asynchronous. You can't really wait for all these things. Uh, how do you handle this asynchronicity? 
Um, there's several solutions. So one thing is um, relying quite heavily on uh, callbacks. So for example, with my queried web client component that is uh, completely dependent on uh, the web client that, so no use of requests or anything, I have uh, two solutions. For one, I created uh, the callbacks here. So I have this on response and I'm getting past the request and response uh, object. So I can then do um, just check to which URI, for example, I send the information. The same is true for um, what I can also do if we look here into the information. Um, well, I can just pass a function because functions are first party um, first party objects in Python. So I can pass objects uh, like function calls around. So what I can do here in uh, like patch, post, put, I can just pass a specific callback function and say, hey, when you get a response, then do that. Right. Um, basically, the same more or less is what's happening with the JSON RCP. Um, here we have the request callback. So I'm sending the event and then on the uh, response callback that I'm getting if I send a request, um, I again get the initial request as an object and then depending on the information and in there I can handle uh, the information. Yeah, awesome. And the time it takes to actually process the request is just that's, that is the blocking part then, I guess. Or the, like a little bit to, to send it and then, you know. Yeah, but there's, there's uh, like it's running completely async, right. so okay, cool. there's uh, no uh, hanging or freezing which you would have with requests. Yeah, exactly. Library, yeah, for yeah, example. exactly. Yeah, cool. I mean, there's, there are some workarounds using submodules, but um, I found using TCP dat and uh, web client dat actually quite usable in that regard. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, nice. And you can also, like, especially the query web client, uh, that you can uh, download this from the OLIP. Uh, I think I should do a plug for that. It's uh, td-olip.org, no longer the, the long one. Uh, we have this error again. I, I really have to invest some time. Um, but if we look here, here's the query web client. You also have some documentation. And actually, the, the best part really is the OLED browser. Oh, I have to. So, this one, as you can see, this is using the query web client beneath, and it's uh, using the same API and same information as uh, the website. Awesome. All right. And also, going to share it here um, Monomango minus development slash TD prefab. So if you're interested in using my prefab or maybe just picking it apart, feel free, um, which is nice. Uh, what is super nice about a GitHub is it's allowing us to define a repository as a template. So what you can do is when you go onto this uh, repository, you don't have to clone it, but instead you can say, create new repository based on this template. And this is super useful, just like even if you do it just for yourself, but creating an ever-evolving base plate and boilerplate that you can use to, to adhere to your own standards um, and even bring other people in your team to use your standards. Um, it's definitely a very nice feature. And this one is public. There are a lot of stuff in this uh, here that is not public, but this is public. Thank you so much. The Thank you so much for this talk. I don't think it was dried at all. <laughs> um, one question, um, one situation. Uh, you have an installation, you know every computer, everyone has its own IP address, and now how do you communicate? And um, either you take the MQTT, have the flexibility to extend the system, and or else do you prefer to do something HTTP or JSON, um, the thing uh, you, uh, what's it like? Uh, JSON RPC, R remote RPC, procedure okay. call. Uh, thank you. Um, then you have uh, um, for troubleshooting, um, yeah, a message back. Then you can troubleshoot it better. What do you prefer, having the um, flexibility to extend the system or the security to troubleshoot it in a better way? Um, 
That's a really good question, actually. Uh, but first thing is, uh, I, that's, I forgot to talk about this, but um, better not dealing with uh, IP addresses. Uh, just plug a DHCP server into your into your network and uh, use host names. Makes your life so much easier because you can give your your computer just a name. So uh, in this case, this one here is called um, AMB minus F15. And instead of using an IP address, you can just use this name. Just as a tip. Um, in regard to which one I like to use the most is it's totally dependent on the project. Like there, there is no perfect f solution. I also, there are situations where I use OSC. It's really not about like one is better than the other, but really one fits it best. Um, JSON RCP really has the, the added bonus. Like if I have a controller, uh, where it's like a very um, controller-centric system, for example, um, which is the case with uh, so many older browsers, which is the case with uh, this project here where we have one key controller. Um, then in this case, it's um, I like to use JSON RCP, but for example, for the table, um, which is a very modular system, um, we are now doing a lot in MQTT because we are also using the engine quite a lot, so being able to um, not have to rely on touch in, touch out, but instead having like this core piece in MQTT helps quite a lot in, in reliability. But what you have to keep in mind is you have to make, uh, you have to document uh, the messages quite well. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, it's actually n not so much, and I think it would be go too deep if we go too deep in there now. But uh, let's say is a playlist loader with uh, start and end times. It takes this from the video files, or we can define it ourselves. And then we have some more stuff like looping and uh, free running and cross fading and. Uh, it's, uh, it loaded quite a lot. And basically, again, is, um, if we look into this, we have uh, assets. You see a repeating pattern. We have projects. So let's go into demo. And then again, we have a config JSON. And in here, I can define segments, breakpoints, scenes. Um, and then on load, I'm constructing this information and sending it out to all the clients. But yeah, that, I mean, we maybe I will uh, talk about this at a round table. Any more questions? Okay, well, thank you very much, Vilan, and for sharing all these tools with the community. And the final thing we're doing today is quick 10-minute uh, uh, quick-fire presentations. So that's going to start in about 10 minutes.
Hello. Um, so for the last part of the day, as Isabel has mentioned, we're going to do some quick fire presentations. Wait, wait, wait. <whistles> nice. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that wow, really worked. Working. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> So we thought this format might fit it nicely. We actually uh, we had talked about it after seeing it at a, um, at a CCC Computer Chaos Conference uh, years ago, and uh, we thought this might be a really nice format for the participants to uh, um, show what they're bringing here. And Greg wants to say something. One sentence. Yeah, we had this um, crazy hunch that uh, out of a. 90, uh, 90 touch design users. A few of them may have some things that they may want to show here for a few minutes uh, during during the uh, during our meetup. So, this is how this thing started. Perfect. And uh, yeah, we filled up those two days quite nicely. And um, we'll start off with Antoine Goldschmidt. Uh, he's specializing in large-scale audiovisual installations and is the founder of Brussels-based studio Magic Street. And uh, you will give us an overview of different projects, processes, and experiences when using Touch Designer in combination with lights. Yes, in, in 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Is that working? Yeah? OK. Hi. Yeah, so, you know, I, I remember from uh, Florence Toe's uh, uh, great uh, talk that, uh, like, attention span is about eight minutes. So by now, you had, like, 36 times, you know, the time to get brain dead. So I will not go into uh, details, but uh, try to show some of my work and, uh, um, and how I got there. Um, so as uh, Marcus um, you know, said I'm working uh, with touch, uh, but mainly in uh, light installation. Uh, I try to uh, create uh, installation where light becomes tangible, becomes an expression. Uh, there's been, you know, light art from a uh, well, century, uh, century old uh, experiments and stuff. So I try to to work with that medium uh, using touch and other software. I will talk about it um, to. Uh, well, actually, I, I got into touch around 2014, I think, and I did like the normal process, like uh, you know, listening to Matthew Reagan's uh, uh, super great uh, uh, tutorials, and then trying to do video mapping, and then trying to do you know particles experiment, uh, interactive stuff, and then I came to um, to a guy that was organizing a festival in Brussels. And then I said, oh, yeah, we should do like this light installation, and it's going to be interactive, et cetera. And then he said, OK, let's do it. And uh, so that's how it started. Like I'm my, my uh, uh, professional uh, TD light installation stuff back in 2017. So this was the uh, first, uh, first installation, eight columns, like it's uh, four meters high. And then it was interactive with big red buttons, uh, which, of course, everyone likes to uh, push. So we got approximately because I put a counter so we had like one million five hundred thousand people pushing the buttons of course you know it's not a hundred uh, one million people but you know children like to push and uh, and light you know I just uh, it was for, for me uh, great to see how just light was still fascinating uh, moving light it's like there's light moving and then everyone looks at it and uh, so um, I got um, uh, yeah this first project and of course, I, I went with just the columns, and they say, "Well, you should also do the, the facade of the church behind." And I say, oh, "Okay, let's do it." And uh, so that was my first uh, TD project, uh, kind of the first of a long series, uh, but worth mentioning it. Uh, and then, yeah, I continued, and I, I have I've been working in a scenographic uh, museum exhibition uh, company before, so I kind of try to work uh, light, space, meaning, you know, emotions, etc. So uh, this was another project where we did uh, uh, 3D uh, soundscape, and uh, and I create the scenography so people would get inside of this uh, circle, and and we'd play with the LEDs and as uh, like custom made uh, stuff with uh, people in Brussels, a lot of talent there. If you haven't been there, come. Um, and then, you know, from one to another, uh, I said, uh, oh, yeah, I should, uh, you know, definitely uh, try to 
work with lasers. So there's a company that just uh, lent me two lasers, quite nice, uh, Solinger laser. Uh, so I say, okay, yeah, you can you know build your stuff, and then I started uh, doing something and then researching, and then I got this space where I could play a little and uh, play with start start uh, working on this project, but uh, no really no real commercial issue, uh, you know. Um, thing and and then some friend were organizing a digital art uh, exhibition and it was like one week before uh, they started and say well we kind of have you know a space and it was the Bourse uh, so uh, in center of Brussels which is huge and uh, so we had like one week to actually uh, finalize this installation with uh, three lasers and uh, suspended PVC tubes and then you know it looked something like this so I did this piece with another um, friend that did the sound and um, this piece was running all in touch designer um, and I was very fortunate that uh, they released the laser uh, job just <laughs> a few months before uh, I had the, the presentation. So we managed to, to do this uh, kind of crazy installation that now has been shown in uh, other city in uh, Geneva for the mapping festival and in Kuwait and so on, some other, uh, other events. So that was a good starting point with the laser. Um, so I'm gonna because time is short. Um, so yeah, as I said, I work with light in many ways. So laser definitely uh, became one of the things I'm using a lot. But I also worked, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm actually building my project first in SketchUp, just, you know, building, um, yeah, objects or uh, scenography space and, you know, not uh, going into uh, visuals. Uh, maybe we can put a bit more sound for, from the computer. Um, yeah, so... Again, this is a, a project I kind of uh, designed this object. It's uh, about 3.5 meters high, uh, so it's a stellated dotecahedrum. Um, and then, yeah, put LEDs inside, etc. And, and then after I had to compose something with it, and um, I was very happy to... Uh, uh, to, to find the Lucas Morgan uh, Geopix, uh, which I recommend because it's like super great if you need to map, uh, you know, LEDs in 3D uh, space because basically the principle is that you put your LEDs, you address them, and then you can use uh, these uh, plans, which are projection uh, planes that actually project the image on the object that receives it. And you can actually combine them and you can you know, do crazy stuff like three-dimensional stuff with uh, LEDs without having to uh, uh, go for you know, detection of the point that is closest to the 3D software, et cetera, which is kind of a tedious um, uh, way of working, I think. So this, this worked very nice uh, for this, uh, this project, Harmonis Stellaris. Um, so yeah. Um, I wanted to show you this thing, which sometimes I get called from uh, people saying, yeah, can you do some laser uh, or LED or, you know, light? Uh, this was for a techno uh, festival in uh, the Antwerp Central Station. And here I basically they say, yeah, we're going to do a ring of LEDs and we want to have lasers and then we want the laser to go with the LEDs and to sync. And so I had like four lasers uh, on uh, yeah, over there, and um, and basically the idea was to match uh, both together, which was already a little challenge, uh, but uh, that we managed to do. But uh, what I found interesting in this project is that I'm not driving the the system, but I create like a virtual fixture for the guy that is on a grandma. Uh, so actually, he's just driving parameters. So just I, I gave him like the technical, uh, you know, the, the, the DMX chart of the, of the fixture, which is actually the, the LEDs plus the, the laser. And I found it quite uh, interesting to, to work like this. 
because you can kind of create an object that doesn't exist in the fixture library, uh, but uh, that can be controlled with a traditional lighting uh, table. Um, right, so he could actually do all his presets, colors, and stuff, which you know he could choose, and then uh, um, and then just play with it. So it could be synced with the the rest of the light setup. Um, so again, that's with TD and uh, parameters, which was very nice. Oops, not again. Um, then yeah, for this uh, bright festival uh, in Brussels, again I created an object and then uh, wanted to, to work with the lasers again. Um, I worked for this project with the Cola that is going to present uh, the next uh, quick fire presentation. Uh, basically, it's a project where we use diodes and we control them with uh, DMX, uh, so like dimmers. And um, the, the, whole, uh, the beams create like uh, surfaces, so hyperboloid, parabolic, parabolic in English, but you get it. Um, and uh, yeah, I think, again, it was a very nice object. The problem was the wind and uh, the haze. It's always a problem in my life and my installations, like you need haze. And when you go outside, you cannot just master this. So that's usually a problem. Um, the next one, uh, oh yeah, that was just for, uh, just, I did a commercial, but it was again using touch to, they, they wanted to do something where they wouldn't use any uh, after effect stuff, and they, they, it was just like, you know, you, they film what's, what's, you know, what we were doing, so um, I was uh, in charge of controlling the whole uh, lights, uh, laser, uh, yeah, and there was uh, like this forest of LEDs and I had to uh, actually map them in 3D space. That was a nightmare, but again, uh, thanks to Geopix, uh, it was possible. I don't know, you don't see it here, but uh, well, yeah, it was just another project type uh, that worth mentioning. And then more recently, uh, well actually uh, beginning of this year, I was commissioned to create an installation for uh, the Moto Show in Brussels. Um, and yeah, that's, I, I got a bit over you know, my head and I said, yeah, we're gonna do this, you know. I mean, in SketchUp, everything is possible. Uh, and then um, I happened to, to make it, <laughs> but it was uh, driving uh, 17 laser 30 watts uh, with a, uh, gigantic uh, LED uh, monolith and uh, a lot of lights. Um, so for this was a, a real challenge, but uh, well, we, <laughs> we made it. Uh, and I'm quite happy with this, uh, this project. Um, so yeah, and it was about cars, but I didn't want to like to show any cars because it's not really you know so they are there and kind of light up but yeah that's uh, that's it but they were happy I call it cycles and then I have a circle so you know a circle and mobility etc so well actually they bought it and I'm happy with it so yeah and uh, and that's my uh, last project that was Again, 2023, that's, I'm a bit tired. Uh, and it was for this uh, Bright Festival also in, in Brussels. And uh, so public space. And here I, you know, after the 17 laser, I thought, yeah, maybe we should do a bit less. So I only had like 12. Uh, and, uh, and it's a very nice uh, place that is a very, the, the, the major view in Brussels when if you go uh, Mont des Arts. Um, again, then here creating stuff where uh, laser lights all combine into a um, three-dimensional tangible light kind of sculpture. I uh, haven't had any uh, physical sculpture, you know, uh, uh, but uh, we did this and that, that was kind of the main uh, yeah, attraction because we managed to put a 30 watt uh, Solinger laser on the top of the Grand Place, um, so the, the tower of the, the main hall, and uh, and using uh, well we couldn't sorry uh, we land, we couldn't put a cable because it was uh, 500 meters away, uh, <laughs> so yeah we, we did it with a with an antenna and then uh, and it was quite uh, an amazing project and everyone was it's like just putting a circle in laser, uh, uh, and, but it's just uh, scenography and uh, very powerful stuff. Uh, next project, and I'm concluding with this, it's gonna be in November, I'm working on a 
piece of Scriabin, which is a Russian composer, uh, end of 19th uh, century, uh, which was synesthet, uh, so he could visualize uh, colors out of sound. Um, and he wrote a piece with uh, uh, a symphonic orchestra and also a, a light organ. So if there are any synesthetes in the, here, uh, I'm uh, happy to hear from you uh, because I'm trying to kind of uh, you know, tackle this subject in many uh, aspects and uh, trying to get close to a synesthesia experience uh, in this uh, new composition that's gonna be in this uh, very nice hall uh, in Antwerp. Um, so yeah, I guess that's it. Uh, I don't know where I'm with the time, but uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, no time for questions. Colas is on next, but uh, Antoine is here if you have questions for him or um, information on synesthesia. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> Coles Fisman, is that pronounced right? Yeah. Is uh, doing next one. Um, with more than 20 years of experience as an artist and a software developer uh, in the VFX, TV, and event industry, Coles has caught our attention as a prolific part of the touch designer community from beginning working with White Void to now running the studio Tyrell. And I remember visiting you at White Void about a couple, five years ago. Uh, uh, one year and a half ago, yeah. One, oh, one year, that year. Oh. Uh, pandemic blur. <laughs> <laughs> so in this presentation, we're going to um, introduce to Pong, a protocol that allows for streaming laser paths in between different applications over the network. That, that's, that's what it. we got. Yeah. Colour. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Colas. I just want to tell a small story because what happened between me arriving in Berlin and me end, uh, ending up here. So I arrived in Berlin yesterday. I went to Monome to see the amazing uh, LED volumetric screen. There I met Mathieu, Maotic. Then we said, let's go for some drinks. We went with uh -oh. some drinks with Mathieu. Yeah, with, exactly. Uh -oh. We ended up at 1 a.m., but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up at 1 a.m. there, then I went back to my hotel, I said, okay, I'm going to sleep a little bit, then I met some crazy people at my hotel, I spent all the night partying with them, <laughs> then coming here, so if my presentation is not clear, it's not my fault, it's the fault of Mathieu and the crazy people <laughs> in my hotel. So I'm just going to speak about a little bit what I do, like that, to have a better idea. So my name is Kola Fisman. I'm living in Brussels, Belgium, like uh, Antoine. And I spend most of my life uh, working in the visual in, uh, effect industry. I work on a lot of movies, I think 30, that's a couple of them. Then at some point, I was tired of it, and I got lucky to be contacted by by uh, White Void in Berlin to work for them. 
and I worked there for two years and a half doing Dutch designer work and working on a lot of their show. Then I was tired of it and I wanted to go back to Belgium. I went back to Belgium to open my company and I was looking for an office and I ended up in an office with uh, Mathieu Beguin that is the main developer of MadMapper. And at that time, they were developing Mad Laser, that is an extension for MadMapper to do laser work. And Mathieu explained me a little bit the kind of feature they added to MadMapper. This kind of thing are almost impossible to do in Touch Designer, except by developing some really complex C++ stuff and this kind of thing. So we had the idea, okay, why we don't use Touch Designer for what is good, do generative content, then feed the laser path to MadMapper, to use like some of the features, like the path optimization, the warping, and the laser dispatching. And so we create that protocol. For Mathieu creates a pro protocol that's called Pong that allows to stream laser paths over network, so between multiple machines or the, from the same machine or different machines and things like that. And I did the uh, implementation in Touch Designer. So we did a simple C++ SOP that can receive any SOP and stream them over the network to Mad Laser. So there is this little node that don't do anything there because all it does is sending the data to, to Mad Laser. We had to do a dirty trick, but Marcus told me that soon it's not going to be necessary anymore because there is a problem in the C++ API of Touch. For the SOP, you cannot know if a primitive is open or closed. So this is why I have a DAT that gets the data if the primitive is open or closed, feed it to my node, like that I can know if I need to close it or not. So I just did this, oh. this simple setup. I just have some SOP animated, and I send that to MadMapper. That is there. And here, you can see I get some input that I can drive there, and naturally it's not working. Actually. Huh? In the, you renamed the software that connects. Ah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You're lost. This wouldn't be necessary. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that, that won't happen if it was not necessary. So here I get the laser pass. And like I, you can see, you can easily do some warping. That is possible to do in Touch Designer also, but it's a little bit tricky. You can uh, add some warping point if you want. Or generate a grid for the warping. and warp the laser pass to be able to map something or something like that. And also, there is a lot of DAC of, uh, of uh, interface for laser that are supported by MadMapper, but are not supported by Touch. So it's a good combination. But one of the coolest features is not that, is that you can ask to MadMapper, you can give it some content and ask it to automatically split it between multiple lasers. Because I don't know if you already did some uh, laser work, but you cannot draw re really complex things with a laser because of the technique it works. So it's cool to be, to be able to combine multiple lasers to draw more complex things. And, and Mathieu did some crazy work to be able to do that automatically. For example, I'm going to do it. Thing. So every square represents a laser projector. Ah, I didn't take the right one. And then the software is automatically splitting the thing like that between multiple lasers. So just to show you an example of the kind of thing that you can do with that. This is a project I did with Antoine also, because Antoine is the kind of guy that do multiple projects for the same festival at the same time. <laughs> Ah, and that, yeah. I don't know why my computer is not working. Normally, it's nicer than that. <laughs> but you can see there we use like eight lasers with a laser dispatching 
to project on a, to do a laser mapping on a building with some really complex uh, animation and this kind of thing. Unfortunately, I cannot see, show it to you. So this is Pong, and this is Mad Laser. So we're going to release it today. So I think I released it today already. And so you can download it on uh, GitHub at, uh, on my GitHub, and you can try it. And that's it. <laughs> I think I went fast, so maybe we can do. Yeah. So if anybody has some question. Huh? Uh, how many lasers? Uh, there is no limit, normally. Okay, thanks, thanks. But if we never find the limit. I think you're not going to make 500 lasers because it's like limited by the computer yeah. and the network. But uh, yeah, you can do a lot of them. And also, yeah, what uh, one of the really important things is that also when you draw things with laser, the order in which you draw the thing is important. And so in touch, you don't really have any control of that. You give it the, the soap. Yeah, you, you can do it by uh, defining in which order you create the soap, but Touch doesn't try to find the, the best way to draw the laser. And Mathieu spent a lot of time implementing algorithm to find the most optimal path to, to draw the laser. So you can draw more complex things that you won't be able to draw by touch, even with one laser. This was my question, actually. Ah. So in, uh, in um, MatMapper, then you get some further processing yes. of the data. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you don't need to do, you don't need to use the laser shop or anything like that. You just create the shop in touch, feed it to Mad, uh, Mad Laser, and it's going to do all the optimization for you. Do you have um, some control over it in yes. Mad Laser? Yes. Uh, there is a lot of parameter here that allow you to to control the path optimization. And in fact, I'm not going to show it, but you can also add some, at, some uh, attributes on the path in touch that will also be streamed. So you can have different parameters for the optimization depending on the path of, of the primitive. Not related to touch designer, but with the safety of the lasers, do the lasers themselves like put limits on where they will shine so you don't burn out people's eyes? Uh, there is also a way in uh, Mad Laser to create some uh, some masks to be sure that the laser won't go there. Okay. okay. Yeah. But by default, no, the laser doesn't have any limit. Fine. There is an angle it can project, but if you do stupid things, you can uh, end up uh, hitting the face of somebody. Yeah. Uh, I see that uh, there is uh, some parameter there, like uh, angle delay, angle repeat. Is that the the parameter that uh, the algorithm take in account to optimize the, the yeah. path? Yeah. So it's basically similar what uh, uh, laser chop do in touch designer. No, because the laser chop is controlling the blanking. So when the laser go off yeah. and on, and how many points it add on the border to be able to think, but the laser shop doesn't change uh, the order in which it's going to throw the path. Okay. So there, there is something that says, okay, maybe I have a square there, I have a square, I have a shape there, I have a shape there, maybe the optimal way to draw it is to draw a part of it, then go to the other one, or this kind of thing. It's not really to, to touch designer, but you know if in Pangolin, using a laser chop, there, there will be this kind of optimization. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. That's it? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Colas. <laughs> Next up, we have Luke Amidou.
Uh, we're adding one quick five minute presentation after Lux, so uh, hold tight for that one. And my name is spelt wrong. <laughs> Marcus. Happy to have Luc Amidou with us. Um, you may have seen an in session episode where Marcus and I hosted Luc for his uh, Instagram work, um, Infratonal, which is really, really beautiful stuff. But today you're here to talk about uh, your AI studio artifact, Paris based, and introduce us to an integration of the node based st stable diffusion interface Comfy UI to Touch Designer which allows with its powerful dual node-based approach for the creation of AI, of generative AI images in Touch Designer. Perfect. Thank you, Isabel. And first, thank you for all the organization uh, here. It's so, so, so good to, to see all those people around Touch Designer. Uh, so thank you again, Touch Designer Node Institute and uh, Hold on. So, yes, I'm going to, to show you some stuff. So, um, maybe I know some of you from Instagram. Yes, my handle is Infratonal. And um, much more focus on some um, AI stuff. So far, I was using a lot of um, computer vision stuff. But um, maybe I'm going to show you something. Um, but indeed, recently, there is a lot of things interesting with the um, generative AI stuff. And I wonder how Touch Designer could be a part of this whole um, generative AI uh, workflow and pipeline. So for example, here, um, I like to, to work with my hand. And usually, I'm using computer vision to, to track the movement and the, uh, of, the, of the hand and to relate it to something um, like a creature or, so, or so, something like that. Here, it's much more um, generative AI stuff. So, oh, the microphone is okay. So maybe some of you ever known um, some um, interfaces for uh, stable diffusion. I'm going to present you one of them. Um, there is a lot of, there is some people, not a lot, but some people that are uh, making some stuff with stable diffusion and uh, touch designer, either based on the API of stability or from um, 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 graphics user interface called Automatic 11, 11, 11, which is very interesting as well. The, 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 um, the interface I'm going to present you today is not that one, it's another one called um, Comfy UI. And this interface is quite interesting because, and it's not here uh, that I'm going to, that I have to convince people, it's completely a node based interface. So, it's presented like that. How many of you ever know this interface? Yes, some of you. OK. Um, so I'm going to load the default interface. OK. So it's presented like that. So um, with stable diffusion, you can load a model, for example. So you have some nodes that allows you to load a model, and then um, you are going to use the prompt, the uh, positive prompt and the negative prompt. And you can begin by, um, by um, text, and that's what we call text to image generation. Or you can begin by an image, it's what we call image to image gen generation. And that's particularly, particularly something very interesting in here. And I'm going to, to show you some stuff around this. But here, for example, for this, um, organization, I'm just going to uh, begin with an empty image. So I'm going to do some text to image 
um, uh, uh, generation. And then I'm going to plug my prompt, my, my model, my uh, previous image or my empty image to a sampler. And here I'm going to choose the number of steps I want uh, for the iteration, for the cre uh, creation of my image. I can choose the, 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 the denoise uh, parameter, for example. The denoise parameter is very um, important in uh, uh, generation of images under stable diffusion. It, um, basically, if the, the, the number is close to one, the algorithm is going to have a lot of freedom to generate an image. If it's close to zero, that means that it's going to respect, for example, if I've got an image in input, it's going to respect the, in, the input the most. So if I've got zero and an image in the, in the input, I'm going to, to have the same image uh, in, the, in the output. And then I'm going to, to uh, plug to a VAE decoder that's going to convert the latent space that are generated the image to the pixel space. And then I'm going to, to, to save the image. So there is a lot of nodes that, I could, that we could use on this interface. Um, there is uh, other samplers, much more advanced. Uh, we can load different images. We can load different kind of models. For, for example, for those who are training their own uh, models, like LoRa, we can load them inside this kind of uh, UI. The, the thing that is very interesting is to load uh, other model called ControlNet. Some of you maybe know. Uh, it's very interesting because the, the, the big um, challenge in uh, generative UI, um, in generative AI, sorry, <laughs> is to uh, control the result. And a model like ControlNet allows people to um, um, like force the result around um, a depth image or a, around the pose. For example, we can load like a skeleton. And so it's very uh, interesting and uh, essential uh, node we can add to, to generate some, something uh, with more control. Uh, we can load save images. We can play with masks to generate just a part of the image. Uh, and there is uh, other kind of, of nodes. The cool things um, that is uh, interesting with uh, ComfUI is that when you are uh, generated, generated an image, it's um, like a PNG file, and you can directly load the PNG file, and it's going to uh, load the whole network um, that you use to generate this precise image. So the question is, how could we, could we integrate this kind of um, node-based interface into Touch Designer, and to have like two node-based interfaces to work on generative AI? The, the, the interesting things with Touch Designer is the fact that, for example, we can um, uh, work all the preprocessing of the image inside Touch, Touch Designer. We can send this to ComfUI, and you can fetch the result inside Touch Designer for doing like some post-processing. So it's going to, we are going to obtain some kind of powerful interface where we can work on the image, we can generate the image, we can work on the post-processing, everything in node-based uh, node um, interfaces. So um, here, I'm not going uh, much more in details for the installation of ComfUI, but you can look, it's quite simple. Uh, the only things I recommend you is to install a virtual environment uh, to just not, not to have much more uh, control on and, um, and the different files and uh, the different um, requirements you, you have to install. Once ConfUI is installed, the cool thing is that it's running um, on, it's a web-based running, so you can use the web browser comp which is a, a base on the web render. And you can directly load the ComfUI interface inside Touch Designer. So um, this interface is really comprised inside the Touch Designer. And the web browser comp has a very cool feature that allows you to inject some JavaScript um, inside the comp to control the web page. So it's going to allow us to launch the render from Touch Designer, which is a very essential features. Uh, for example, if we want to 
uh, process batches of files, video, for example. That means that we are going to be able, from Touch Designer, to create well, our own autonomous pipelines uh, with um, the treatment of each images, uh, the one after the other. Uh, in ComfUI, so I'm, I'm loaded um, this example. So um, in this um, in this one, so I've got a model that I've loaded. I've got a prompt. It's quite complex because I added a lot of uh, precision uh, on what I really want to have. I'm just coming back to this. And I'm going to load this, the, um, the base image. It's this fisherman. This base image is coming from uh, my touch designer network. It's here. But you can imagine having just a still image, a video, or a 3D image you are calculating in real time. Um, and then um, touch designer is going to save this image. And uh, ConfiUI is going to load this image. The cool thing with ConfiUI is the fact that I told you that you can integrate um, ControlNet. And ControlNet, for example, allows you to load depth image, for example, of the scene. So you can, for example, uh, create the depth uh, image of the scene and load it in ConfiUI as well. You can create the skeleton of the scene with open pose or media pipes or stuff, stuff like that and load directly the pose of the scene inside ConfiUI. Um, here I've got two control nets. I've got one control net to control the, um, the pose. So I want an image that respects the pose of my, my fisherman. And I've got a control net to respect the color. It's not a control net, it's, the, uh, T, um, it's an adapter. It's kind of the same thing. Um, I've got just a shortcut to launch the calculation. And here I've got my, uh, my uh, inference uh, that is running. And from that point, in Touch Designer, I'm going to uh, watch for the, um, the creation of the image in my uh, directory of ComfUI. And once it's going to be created, it's not this one, it's my previous uh, creation. But here, I wanted to create, sorry, I didn't uh, focus on the prompt, but it's a fireman holding a chicken. So I've got my fireman holding a chicken instead of my fisherman holding the, the, the fish. And it respects the poses and it respect, respect the color. So with this really simple pipelines. We can imagine having a lot of possibilities for a generative, generative AI and much more, for example, for the video, uh, to process the video and to keep a lot of control, a lot of consistency. So I hope that you are going to, to use this uh, to make some cool things. And if there is some uh, JavaScript wizard in the, in, the, in the room, I would be interested to to work with, uh, with them uh, to improve the, the connection between Touch Designer and uh, the ComfyUI interface. That's it. Oh, I have a question. Uh, is it possible to send the several requests at the same time, like to speed up the, um, uh, the generation like to make it a, 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 at least a bit real time. Um, <laughs> you can send several requests at the same time, I think, but you have to have several uh, stable diffusion loaded. Uh, so several interfaces, several comfy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. B because behind the interfaces there is the stable diffusion that are running and waiting for the image to render it. Um, and if you wanted to use video, you would have to go batch, like you would have to send one image in yeah. bit for the pro and trigger the whole process again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On stable diffusion, the main um, way to work on the video is to work image by, uh, by image. And um, the, the, the big challenge in the video is the stability 
and uh, the consistency of the video. And thanks to models like ControlNet, you can increase the stability because you forced the, the, the generation to respect the poses, the color, or the depth, or the, 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 the edge, or whatever, whatever you want. And so with the depth, you could generate, like, uh, you have a 3D scene, yeah. you just feed it the depth, and then you could fill it in with, like, Whatever. Exactly. You can generate the, the, the depth map inside touch, de touch designer. It's going to be much more precise than the depth map that it could be that could be generated by the AI, because, for example, in this control net there is an algorithm that generates the depth map from scratch, but it's usually not super precise. But if you are generating the depth map with the depth top, it's going to be perfectly precise uh, from your three D scene. Thank you. Hi, uh, is the forum implemented in the Config UI? No, the forum is not implemented. But for the forum is um, um, a plugin used in Automatic 11.11. 11, uh, yeah, mainly, this is what I'm using. Yeah, to, to um, work animation. And for example, what the forum do is to um, change the, the, the initial image by moving the Im initial image and uh, to change the prompt during the, the calculation. Yeah. But we can imagine doing this, uh, creating our own D forum with a touch designer, because we can do whatever you want with the initial image. We can re-inject the image that is, has been calculated. We can even change the prompt during the calculation. So the idea with this kind of connection is to have much more freedom to, 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 to control the, the generation of a video. But it's not included in, in, this, uh, in this first version. But in uh, ConfUI, um, people have the ability to create their own nodes. So there is a community, not very strong and not very large, but some people are creating nodes uh, specifically for ConfUI, uh, notably nodes uh, around masks, which is very interesting. Thank you. Uh, is there any resource online where we can uh, have information about uh, where to install, how to install, and uh, yes, how on to the, run there it? is a GitHub of ConfUI. It's very um, simple to install, and I will, for those who want to, uh, I can send uh, my small uh, touch designer um, project for you to experiment with. Okay, so thank you very much, Luke. Thank you very much. We have a surprise quick fire. I forgot the names, but this is about Lighthouse. Yeah, Please. Uh, yeah, them. okay. Please say them. Hello, everyone. Um, this is not as much a prepared quick fire presentation as a very spontaneous and uh, just hello to every one of you and a little um, scribbled notes and a lovely but hack and slash presentation that came about together with Resolve to get up here around 30 seconds ago. 30 seconds ago. <laughs> um, my name is Baltasar and uh, this is my dear friend and colleague Francesco. And I wanted to start a little bit this improvised uh, speech uh, to quote Roy and Tim, because they very factually pointed out earlier that as the big and bombastic Team Lab art collective broke into the mainstream, a lot of commercial actors realized that uh, there is money to be made in this, and uh, hopefully for us creatives, also somewhere more to live. And so four years ago, I got recruited into a project that uh, meant to open immersive projection spaces and uh, a couple of uh, team switches and different constellations and a uh, pandemic later we opened our first uh, venue about a year and a half ago here in Berlin it's called the Lighthouse of Digital Art some of you might be familiar with it some of you might hear the name for the first time we're over here near next to Warschauerstraße in the Rave Gelände which is a very cool cultural hotspot if you guys haven't been there do check it out and uh, yeah, uh, I am now the founder and creative director of that place. And uh, from this coming Friday, 
uh, also of our second place. Uh, we are opening a much bigger mixed media art space called the Chroma New Media Art Center. It is next door. Uh, it is uh, around 1,800 square meters. We have opened 1,200 square meters now and aim to open uh, our second floor uh, sometime this fall. Um, yeah, so that's the commercial factor and aspect of the thing. Francesco is our uh, brilliant technician that makes everything work and implements all our visions. And uh, right now in the Chroma, we are hosting a lot of crazy international artists who have come with incredible artworks. So I would love to invite you all there whenever you want to come. We're opening on Friday. Uh, meanwhile, since a year, uh, we are also quite passionate artists and we've made sure to set aside one uh, one evening a month at the lighthouse uh, at the lighthouse uh, to close the door to the public and open it up to the local AV community and uh, to give people a space to experiment to use our canvas uh, to get together to try out their projects and uh, yeah whatever other ideas come up we've ho we've uh, organized one festival it was under the umbrella of uh, the Forspiel, uh, the CTM Forspiel in January, and we aim to do another one follow up in November, I think. And uh, yeah, this is a bit of a reach out and invitation. We uh, recently switched from uh, a one way Telegram, very confusing 40 people uh, group, to a Discord that we hope will be collectively driven and community um, driven so that we can uh, get to the next level of, of thinking what we want to do with this wonderful space and opportunity. And uh, this is a link, and you're very welcome to join us. And uh, we have our next meetup uh, Tuesday next week uh, at 7 at the Lighthouse of Digital Art. Uh, it's also in the, it's Revale Strasse 99. But uh, for anyone of you from Berlin, you know that that is about a 100 meter long, 200 meter long space with around 40 houses. So um, just check for the big chroma sign, because that got up, came up last Friday, I think. And if you follow that alley in, you will find the, light the Lighthouse of the Little Art. Also, we're on, I think, Google Maps. Are we on Google Maps? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're on Google Maps. You can, you can try to find us. And if you're in the Discord, we'll try also to help you find us. So, do you have something to? No, I just add? wanted to add that, yeah, like, uh, Touch Designer has been basically our, yeah, Touch Designer has been our main uh, software for, like, rendering real-time content in the venue at the moment. And uh, we are also hosting uh, a number of, like, immersive concerts and uh, other, like, um, blending of, like, the different arts together. And, uh, yeah, in our after hours, we are uh, having at the moment, yeah, a uh, uh, render machine set up already with Touch Designer installed. So um, anybody who is, like, uh, is very welcome, yeah, to test out also immersive patches and, like, 360 and floor. Um, immersive experiences and uh, renders. So yeah, please do join our Discord and like we are trying to like help out like uh, artists to simply like work on this new pipeline because I th we think that is a great environment that is a ever evolving uh, uh, situation of like uh, a lot of new technology and uh, it's not always easy to find the right spaces to actually test out stuff and experiment. So yeah, please uh, come over and have fun with us. And uh, just as a parenthesis, we're also having a lot of other software, uh, people practicing other softwares as well, uh, as well present. So it's a nice to also to building bridges between communities and things. So that's, I think, also what we aim to be, like a place where people from all, all uh, well, let's call it software, but all communities uh, can meet and just make bridges and see what, what happens. Yeah, and that's us, I think. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, that brings us to the conclusion of our day one Holon daytime um, event. Next up at uh, 1900, the doors open at the um, Zeiss Gross Planetarium. And uh, you are um, encouraged to come around 7 because programming will start at 7.30. Um, I'd like to really thank everybody for their presentations today. I um, think our heads are really full and we have one more day and one more night. And uh, um, I know Stefan wants to make a state, wants to say something. Greg, do you want to say something? Mm. 
Yeah. Um, we sent out in the email to everybody that uh, on Thursday, Dark Matter has reserved sort of the final time slots of the evening for whoever wants to come. Um, so it'd be actually really good to know who does want to come because they've reserved 100 spaces and we're fewer than 100. So maybe we'll do like a sign up something somewhere. And, uh, and then tomorrow night, tomorrow after the daytime event, we're going to... Uh, Alter Roter Löwe Rhein <laughs> in Neukölln. Um, yeah, um, the, the announcement that I wanted to make is that I have to admit that we will have a bit of chaotic entry situation at the planetarium, so we have not rehearsed this. So the doors open at 7, and I would please ask the ticket holders and you know the people who are engaged here to be there in time, because we have actually slightly overbooked the venue. And there's no, there's, I just see that it will be very difficult to tell the other people who are not ticket holders to, that they have to wait until the last ticket holder comes. So we will have to be democratic about it. And the best way to ensure that all of you have a place there is that you're there 0.7. Um, you don't miss out on anything but food. We're going to have a bar. Um, it's going to be lovely people, especially if you all come. It's going to be even more lovely people. But <laughs> being in time is kind of crucial to ensure your VIP status in this situation. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that, but uh, there's no way we can handle it differently. But it's going to be a great evening, so um, we are very much looking forward to have you there. Thank you.